Section 21 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland Volume 1 From the Beginning Until the Death of Alexander I, 1825 By Shimon Dubunov Translated by Israel Friedlander This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea Chapter 10 the Enlightened Absolutism of Alexander I, Part 1 1. The Committee for the Amelioration of the Jews The liberal breeze which began to stir in the first years of Alexander I's reign sent a refreshing current of air through the stuffy atmosphere of the St. Petersburg chancellors, in which Russian bureaucrats, undisturbed by their utter ignorance of Judaism, were devising ways and means of turning Jewish life upside down. It took some time, however, before the Jewish question was taken up again. In 1801 and 1802, the government was busy rearranging the whole machinery of the administration. With the formation of the ministries and of the Council of State, the Senate lost its former executive power, and as a result, the material relating to the Jewish question, which had been in its possession, had to be transferred to a new official agency. Such an agency was called into being in November 1802. By the order of the Tsar, a special committee for the amelioration of the Jews was organized, and the following were appointed its members. Kutzbay, Minister of the Interior, Birzabin, the specialist on Judaism, at that time, Minister of Justice, Count Zubov, and two high officials of Polish birth, Adam Chatoriski, Assistant Minister for Foreign Affairs, an intimate friend of Alexander I, and Severin Potosky, a member of the Senate. The committee was charged with the investigation of all the problems touched upon in Dirzabin's opinion concerning the curbing of the avaricious pursuits of the Jews in White Russia with a view to extending the amelioration of the Jews also to the other governments acquired from Poland. Rumors to the effect that a special committee on Jewish affairs had been instituted at St. Petersburg and that its work was to follow the lines laid down in the project of the Dirzabin caused considerable alarm among the Jews of the Northwest who knew but too well the anti-Semitic leanings of the former senator and inspector. The Kahal of Minsk held a special meeting in December 1802, which passed the following resolution. Whereas disquieting rumors have reached us from the capital to the effect that matters involving the Jew as a whole have now been entrusted to the hands of five dignitaries with power to dispose of them as they see fit, be it resolved that it is necessary to proceed to St. Petersburg and petition our sovereign not to allow them, the dignitaries, to introduce any innovations among us. A public appeal was made for funds to provide the expenses of the delegates. Moreover, a fast of three days was imposed on all the members of the community, during which prayers were to be offered up in the synagogues for averting the calamity which the government threatened to bring upon the Jews. When the Minister of the Interior, Kutzbay, learned of the excitement prevailing among the Jews, he sent in January 1803 a circular to the governors instructing them to allay the fears of the Jews. The Kahals were to be informed that in appointing the Committee for the Investigation of Jewish Matters, there was no intention whatsoever to impair their status or to curtail any substantial advantage enjoyed by them. But on the contrary, it was proposed to offer them better conditions and greater security. This verbal assurance was not nearly so effective in quieting the minds of the Jews as action taken by the government at the same time. In the beginning of 1803, the Jewish committee resolved to invite deputies from all the gubernatorial kahals to St. Petersburg for the purpose of ascertaining their views 
as to the need of the Jewish people, which the government had planned to transform without its own knowledge. This was the first departure from the red tape routine of St. Petersburg. Towards the end of January 1803, active preparations were set afoot by the Kahals for sending such deputies. During the winter and spring, the Russian capital witnessed the arrival of Jewish deputies from the governments of Minsk, Podolia, Mogilev, and Kiev, no information being available about the other governments. The deputies soon had occasion to rejoice in Dirzabin's retirement from membership in the Jewish Committee, following upon his resignation from the post of Minister of Justice. Being a conservative of the real Russian type, Dirzabin was out of place in a liberal government such as ruled the destinies of Russia in the early years of Alexander's reign. With his retirement, his opinion ceased to serve as an obligatory rule of conduct for the members of the committee. On arriving in St. Petersburg, the deputies from the provinces found there a small group of Jews, mostly natives of White Russia, who lived temporarily in the capital in connection with their business affairs. Though denied the right of permanent domicile in the capital of the empire, this handful of barely tolerate Jews had managed to secure the right of dying there and of burying their dead in their own cemetery. The opening of the cemetery in 1802 marks, symbolically, the inception of the Jewish community in St. Petersburg. In the same sign of death, the provincial deputies met the Metropolitan Brethren at a rather strange celebration in the summer of 1803. At the suggestion of the deputies and in their presence, the remains of three Jews who had been buried in a Christian cemetery was transferred to the newly acquired Jewish cemetery. Among the Jews of St. Petersburg, there were several men at that time who, owing to their connections with high officials and because of their familiarity with bureaucratic ways, were able to be of substantial service to the deputies from the provinces. One of these Jews, Nota Shklova, who about that time received the family name Notkin, the same public-spirited merchant who in 1800 had submitted his reform project to Dilzavin, acted, it would seem, as the official advisor of the deputies, having been invited some time previously to participate in the labors of the Jewish committee. While on the committee, he continually insisted on his scheme of promoting agriculture and manufacture among the Jews, but he did not live to see the triumph of his ideas. He died shortly before the enactment of the law of 1804, in which his pet theory found due recognition. Another St. Petersburg Jew, the wealthy contractor and commercial counselor, Abraham Peretz, took no immediate part in Jewish affairs. Yet he too was some service to the deputies owing to his business relations with the official world. In the meantime, the Committee for the Amelioration of the Jews, after scrutinizing the different projects submitted to it, had worked out a general plan of reform and communicated it to the Jewish deputies. After prolonged indecision, the Jewish deputies announced that they were not in a position to submit their conclusions without previous consultation with the cars by which they had been elected. They accordingly asked for a half-year respite for the purpose of consultation. The official Jewish committee, on the other hand, could not agree to so protracted a delay in its labors and resolved to submit, through the medium of the government, the principal clauses of the project to the Kahals, with the understanding that the latter, without making any changes in the aforesaid clauses, should confine themselves to suggestions as to the best ways and means of carrying the proposed reforms into effect. The epistolary inquiry failed to produce the desired effect. Restricted beforehand in their free expression of opinion, and having no right to speak their mind as to the substance of the project, 
The Kahars, in replying, limited themselves to the request that the correctional measures be postponed for 20 years, particularly as far as the proposed prohibition of the sale of liquor and land tenure was concerned, which prohibition would undermine the whole economic structure of Jewish life. The committee paid no heed to the plea of the Kahals, which was tantamount to a condemnation of the basic principles of the project, and proceeded to work in the direction originally decided upon. Nor was there perfect unanimity within the committee itself. Two tendencies, it seems, were struggling for mastery. Utilitarianism, represented by the champions of correctional measures and of a compulsory transformation of Jewish life, and humanitarianism, advocated by the spokesmen of unconditional emancipation. To the latter class belonged Speransky, the brilliant and enlightened statesman who might have succeeded in liberating the empire of the Tsars a hundred years ago, had he not fallen a victim to the fatal conditions of Russian life. At the time we are speaking of, he served in the Ministry of the Interior under Kutzbay and was engaged in elaborating plans of reform for the various departments of the civil service. Speransky took an active interest in the Committee for the Amelioration of the Jews and frequently acted as Kutzbay's substitute. There was a time when his influence in the committee was predominant. It was evidently under his influence that the remarkable sentences embodied in the minutes of the committee meeting of September 20, 1803 were penned. Reforms brought about by the power of the state are as a rule unstable and are particularly untenable in those cases in which that power has to grapple with the habits of centuries. Hence, it seems both better and safer to guide the Jews to perfection by throwing open to them the avenues leading to their own happiness, by observing their movements from a distance, and by removing everything that might turn them away from this path, without using any manner of force, without establishing special agencies for them, without endeavoring to act in their stead, but by merely opening the way for their own activities. As few restrictions as possible, as many liberties as possible, these are the simple elements of every social order. Since the government had begun to dabble in the Jewish question, this was the first rational utterance coming from the ranks of the Russian bureaucracy. It implied an emphatic condemnation of the system of state patronage and correctional measures by means of which Russian officialdom then and thereafter sought to transform a whole nation. Here, for the first time, was voiced the lofty precept of humanitarianism, grant the Jews untrammeled possibilities of development, give full scope to their energies, and the Jews themselves will in the end choose the way which leads to perfection and progress. But even the liberalizing statesmen of that period could not maintain themselves on that high eminence of political thought. Speransky's conception was too tender a blossom for the rough climate of Russia, even in this springtide. The blossom was bound to wither. As far as the Committee for the Amelioration of the Jews was concerned, the hackneyed political wisdom of the age, the system of patronage and compulsory reforms, came to the fore again. The report submitted by the Jewish Committee to Alexander I in October 1804 reveals no trace of that radical liberalism which a year before had come to light in the minutes of the committee. The report begins by the determining the approximated size of the Jewish population, computing the number of registered, taxable males at 174,385, a figure which represents less than a fifth of the whole Jewish population. In other words, the total number of Jews in the estimates of the committee approached one million. The report proceeds to point out that this entire mass is huddled together in the annexed Polish and Lithuanian provinces and in Little Russia and Kurland, 
and is barred from the governments of the interior, a statement followed by an historical excursus tending to show that the Jews have never been allowed to settle in Russia. The Tsar is further informed that the Jews are obliged to pay double taxes, that notwithstanding the fact that they are liable to the general courts and municipalities and that their cars are subordinate to the gubernatorial police, the Jews still keep aloof from the institutions of the land and manage their affairs through the kahars. Finally, it is pointed out that the sale of liquor, the most widespread occupation among Jews, is a source of abuses, calling forth complaints from the surrounding population. Basing its deduction on these premises, the committee drafted a law which in its principal features was embodied in the statute concerning the organization of the Jews issued with the sanctions of the Tsar soon afterwards on December 9, 1804. 2. The Jewish Constitution of 1804 The new charter, a mixture of liberties and disabilities, was prompted, as is stated in the preamble, by solicitude for the true welfare of the Jews, as well as for the advantage of the native population of those governments in which these people are allowed to live. The concluding part of the sentence anticipates the way in which the question of Jewish area of settlement is solved. It remained limited as theretofore to 13 governments, two in Lithuania, two in White Russia, two in Little Russia, those of Minsk, Volhynia, Kiev, and Podolia, and finally three in New Russia. A slightly larger area is conceded by the new statute to the future class of Jewish agriculturalists projected in the same statute. They are permitted to settle in addition in two interior governments, those of Astrakhan and Caucasia. Economically, the new statute establishes two opposite poles, a negative pole as far as the rural occupation of innkeeping and land tenure are concerned, which are to be exterminated ruthlessly, and the positive pole as far as agriculture is involved, which on the contrary is stimulated and promoted among Jews in every possible manner. Clause 34, the severest provision of the whole act, is directed not only against innkeeping, but also rural occupations in general. It reads as follows. Beginning with January 1, 1807, in the governments of Astrakhan and Caucasia, also in those of Little Russia and New Russia, and beginning with January 1, 1808, in the other governments, no one among the Jews in any village or hamlet shall be permitted to hold any leases on land to keep taverns saloons or inns, whether under his own name or under a strange name, or to sell wine in them, or even to live in them under any pretext whatever, except when passing through. With one stroke, this clause eliminated from the economic life of the Jews an occupation which, though far from being distinguished, had yet afforded a livelihood to almost one-half of the whole Jewish population of Russia. Moreover, the non too extensive territory of the Jewish Pale of Settlement was still more limited by excluding from it the enormous area of villages and hamlets. The economic and legal blow aimed at the Jews in the Statute of 1804 was to be made good by the privileges held forth to those willing to engage in agriculture. Such Jews were accorded the right of buying unoccupied lands in all the western and in two of the eastern governments or of establishing themselves on crown lands. In the latter case, the settlers were to be assigned definite parcels of land and for the first few years be exempt from state taxes. However, it soon became evident that the proposed remedy was out of proportion to the seriousness of the wounds that had been inflicted. While hundreds of thousands of Jews were driven from the rural occupations with which 
their economic life had been bound up for centuries. The new branch of labor opened to the Jews. The pursuit of agriculture could, for some time to come, attract, at the utmost, only a few insignificant groups of the Jewish population. Among the favored occupations, ranging in importance beneath agriculture, the new law includes industry and handicrafts. Manufacturers and artisans were declared exempt from the double tax imposed on Jews, and the founders of the most needed factories are promised, in addition, a government loan. The Jewish merchants and burghers are placed in the last rank, being merely tolerated. Manufacturers, artisans, and merchants are given permission to sojourn temporarily for the business purposes in the interior governments, not excluding the capitals, but not otherwise than with gubernatorial passports, such as are given for going abroad. In the chapter entitled On the Civil Organization of the Jews, the new charter establishes, on the one hand, the liability of the Jews to the authority of the municipalities, the common police and the common law courts, and grants the Jews, on the other hand, the right of electing rabbis and kahalmen, who shall be replaced every three years and shall be ratified by the gubernatorial administration. Special clauses provide that the rabbis are obliged to look after all the ceremonies of the Jewish faith and decide all disputes bearing on religion, but they are strictly forbidden to resort to anathemas and excommunications, the so-called harem. The Kahals, in turn, are held responsible for the regular payment of the state taxes. The communal autonomy of the Jews was thus calculated to serve two masters, religion and the exchequer, God and Mammon, and was expected to adjust its manifold problems to both. The Jewish constitution of 1804 is provided as it were with the European label. Its first chapter bears the heading on Enlightenment. Jewish children are granted free access to all public schools, gymnasiums, and universities in the Russian Empire. The Jews are also granted the right of opening their own schools for secular culture, one of three languages, Russian, Polish, or German, to be obligatory. One of these languages is also, within a period of two to six years from the promulgation of the law, to become obligatory for all public documents, promissory notes, commercial ledgers, etc. The Jews, elected members of municipalities, were chosen as rabbis and kahal members are obliged within a definite term, 1808 to 1812, to know one of these three languages to the extent of being able to write and speak. Moreover, the Jewish members of the municipalities are expected to wear clothes of the Polish, Russian, or German pattern. This enlightened program represents the tribute which the Russian government felt obliged to render to the spirit of the age, the spirit of enlightened Prussian absolutism rather than that of French emancipation. It was the typical sample of a Prusso-Austrian reglement embodying the very system of reforms brought about by the powers of the state against which Speransky had vainly cautioned. In concrete reality, this system resulted in nothing else than the violent breakup of a structure built by centuries, relentless coercion on the one hand and suffering of the patronized masses on the other. End of section 21. Section 22 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 1. From the beginning until the death of Alexander the First, 1825, by Shimon Dubunov, translated by Israel Friedlander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by S. S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. Chapter 10: The Enlightened Absolutism of Alexander the First, Part Two. Three. 
the projected expulsion from the villages. The legal enactment of 1804 was appraised by the Russian Jews at its true value, problematic benefits in the future, and undeniable hardships for the present. The prospect of future benefits, the attainment of which was conditioned by the weakening of the time-honored foundations of stalwart Jewish cultural life, expressing itself in language, school, and communal self-government, had no fascination for Russian Jews, who had not yet been touched by the influences of Western Europe. But what the Russian Jews did feel, and feel with sickening pain, was the imminence of a terrible economic catastrophe, the expulsion of hundreds of thousands of Jews from the villages. It soon became evident that the expulsion would affect 60,000 Jewish families, or about half a million Jews. Needless to say, within the two or three years of respite, which remained before the catastrophe, this huge mass could not possibly gain access to new fields of labor and establish itself in new domiciles, and it was therefore in danger of being starved to death. In consequence, St. Petersburg was flooded with petitions imploring the authorities to postpone the expulsion for a time. These petitions came not only from the Kahals, but also from country squires for whom the removal of the Jewish tenants and innkeepers from their estates entailed considerable financial losses. With the approach of the year 1808, the time limit set for the expulsion, the shouts of despair from the provinces became louder and louder. It is difficult to say whether the Russian government would have responded to the terrible outcry had it not been for an event which set all the political circles of St. Petersburg agog. It was in the autumn of 1806. The Jewish parliament in Paris, which had been assembled by Napoleon, was concluding its sessions and was sending out appeals to all the countries of Europe, announcing the impending convocation of the Great Synhedrion. This new fad of Napoleon disturbed all the European governments which were on terms of enmity with the French emperor and had reason to fear the discontent of their Jewish subjects. The Austrian government went so far as to forbid the Jews to enter into any relations with dangerous Paris. St. Petersburg, too, became alarmed. Napoleon, who had just shattered Prussia and had already entered her Polish provinces, was gradually approaching the borders of hostile Russia. The awe inspired by the statement-like genius of the French emperor made the Russian government suspect that the convocation of a universal Jewish synhedrion in Paris was merely a Napoleonic device to dispose the Jewish masses of Prussia, Austria, and Russia in its favor. In these circumstances, it seemed likely that the resentment aroused in the Russian Jews by the imminent expulsion from the villages would provide a favorable soil for the wily agitation of Napoleon and would create a hotbed of anti-Russian sentiment in the very regions soon to become the theater of war. To avoid such risks, it seemed imperative to extinguish the flame of discontent and stop the expulsion. Thus, it came about that in the beginning of February 1807, at the very moment when the sessions of the Sniadrian were opened in Paris, the Minister of the Interior, Kotsubai, submitted a report to Alexander I, in which he pointed out the necessity of postponing the transplantation of the Jews from the villages into the towns and townlets, so as to guard this nation in general against the intentions of the French government. The Tsar concurred in this opinion, with the result that a special committee was immediately formed to consider the practical application of the Statute of 1804. 
Apart from Kuzbai and other high officials, the committee included the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Budwork, diplomatic considerations being involved in the question. On February 15th, Senator Alexeyev was directed to inspect the western provinces and find out to what extent the military circumstances and the present condition of the border provinces, as well as the economic ruins of the Jews, which is inevitable if their expulsion be enforced, render this expulsion difficult or even impossible of execution. At the same time, the Minister of the Interior instructed the administrators of the Western governments to prevent the slightest contact between the Jews of Russia and the Synedrion in Paris, which the French government was using as a tool to curry political favor with the Jews. The same circular letter to the governors recommends another rather curious device. It suggests that the Jews be impressed with the idea that the Synedrion in Paris was endeavoring to modify the Jewish religion and for this reason did not deserve the sympathy of the Russian Jews. At the same time, Holy Synod was sending out circulars instructing the Greek Orthodox clergy to inform the Russian people that Napoleon was an enemy of the Church and a friend of the Jews, that he might the more effectively put the Church of Christ to shame. So the Holy Synod proclaimed, Napoleon assembled the Judean synagogues in France and established the great synedrion of the Jews, that same ungodly assembly which had once dared pass the sentence of crucifixion upon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and he now planned to unite the Jews whom the wrath of the Almighty had scattered over the face of the whole earth so as to incite them to overthrow the Christian church and proclaim the pseudo-Messiah in the person of Napoleon. By these devices, the government, finding itself at its wit's end in the face of a great war, shrewdly attempted to frighten at once the Jewish people by the specter of an anti-Jewish Napoleon and the Orthodox Russians by Napoleon's leaning toward Judaism. The former were made to believe that the Synedrion was directed against the Jewish religion, and the latter were told that it was established by the Jewish pseudo-Messiah for the overthrow of Christianity. In this precarious situation, the government once more decided to ascertain, by means of circular inquiry, the views of representatives of the Jewish communities on the best ways of carrying the reform into effect. The U case of February 19, issued by the Tsar on this occasion, is couched in surprisingly mild terms. Prompted by the desire to give our subjects of the Jewish nationality another proof of our solicitude about their welfare, we have deemed it right to allow all the Jewish communes in the governments of Vilna, Grodno, Kiev, Minsk, Podolia, Volhynia, Vitebsk, and Mogilev to elect deputies and to suggest through them to the gubernatorial administrators the means which they themselves consider best fitted for the most successful execution of the measures laid down in the Statute of 1804. The deputies were summoned this time not to St. Petersburg, but to the provincial capitals in order to present their opinions to the governors. The expression of opinion on the part of the Jewish deputies, or as they were officially styled, the attorneys of the Jewish communes, did not limit itself to the fatal 34th clause, which all the deputies wished to see repealed, or at least postponed for an indefinite period. Serious objections were raised also to the other provisions of the Jewish constitution. The deputies advocated the abolition of double taxation for all classes of Jewish population. They asked for a larger range of authority for the rabbinical tribunals and for a mitigation 
of the provisions forbidding the use of Hebrew in legal documents, promissory notes, and commercial ledgers. Some of them pleaded for a postponement of law concerning Hebrew as being inconvenient to business, while others suggested permitting the use of Hebrew for promissory notes up to the sum of 100 rubles. The deputies also called attention to the difficulty on the part of the rabbis and Jewish members of magistracies of acquiring the Russian language within so short a period. They were ready to assent to the change of dress for the magistrates and those living temporarily outside the pale. But they pointed out at the same time that the prescribed German dress was not becoming to Jews, who, on account of religious scruples, refused to shave their beards, and that in the case of magistrates and visitors to the Russian interior, they would prefer to adopt the Russian form of dress. As for the laws relating to education, the deputies observed that it would be useless for Jewish children to go to the common Russian schools as long as they did not understand the Russian language, and that it would, for this reason, seem more practicable first to have them acquire the Russian language in the Jewish schools where they were taught the Hebrew language and the dogmas of the faith. By the time the opinions of the deputies were conveyed by the governors to St. Petersburg, the political sentiment there had undergone a change. In July 1807, the Peace of Tilsit had been concluded. An entente cordiale had been established between Napoleon and Alexander I, and Russia no more stood in awe of Bonaparte's intrigues. There was no more reason to fear a secret understanding between the Russian Jews and the Parisian Sinedrion, which had shortly before been prorogued, and the bureaucratic compassion for the unfortunate Jews vanished into air. The last term set for the expulsion from the villages, January 1st, 1808, was drawing near, and two months before this date, on October 19, 1807, the Tsar addressed a new case marked by extraordinary severity to the governor-general of the western region. The circumstances connected with the war, the UK's states in part, were of a nature to complicate and suspend the transplantation of the Jews. These complications can now, after the cessation of the war, be averted in the future by means of a gradual and most convenient arrangement of the work of transplantation. For these reasons, we deem it right to lay down an arrangement by means of which the transplantation of the Jews, beginning with the date referred to above, may be carried into effect without the slightest delay and mitigation. The arrangement alluded to consisted in spreading the expulsion from the villages over three years. One-third of the Jews were to be expelled in 1808, another third in 1809, and the last third in 1810. Committees were appointed to assist the governors in carrying out the expulsion decree. These committees were instructed to make it incumbent upon the Kahals to render financial assistance to the expelled, to those who were being pitilessly ruined by the government. The horrors of the expulsion began. Those who did not go willingly were made to leave by force. Many were ejected ruthlessly under the escort of peasants and soldiers. They were driven like cattle into the townlets and cities, and left there on the public squares in the open air. The way in which the expulsion from the villages was carried out in the government of Vitebsk was particularly ferocious. Scores of exiled Jews petitioned the authorities to have them transferred to New Russia to the agricultural colonies in which several hundred Jewish families had found some kind of shelter. But the supply of arable land and the funds set aside for the transfer 
were found to be exhausted. The appeals, therefore, remained unheeded. The distress of the Jewish masses reached such colossal proportions that the governors themselves, in their reports to the central government, declared that it was impossible to carry out the expulsion decree without subjecting the Jews to complete ruin. Accordingly, a new ukase was issued in the last days of December 1808 to the effect that the Jews be left in their former domiciles pending special imperial orders. In the beginning of January 1809, a new committee, chronologically the third, was appointed in St. Petersburg for the purpose of examining all the phases of the problem of devoting the Jews from the rural liquor traffic to other branches of labor. This time, the committee consisted of Senator Alexeyev, who had made a tour of inspection through the western provinces, Privy Councilor Popov, Assistant Minister of the Interior Kozdaglev, and others. In his instructions to Popov, who was chairman of the committee, the Tsar admits that the impossibility of removing the Jews from the villages results from the fact that the Jews themselves, on account of their destitute condition, have no means which would enable them, after leaving their present abodes, to settle and found a home in their new surroundings, while the government is equally unable to undertake to place them all in new domiciles. It has therefore been found necessary to seek ways and means whereby the Jews, having been removed from their exclusive pursuit of selling wine in the villages, hamlets, inns, and public houses, may be enabled to earn a livelihood by labor. At the same time, the committee was directed to take into consideration the opinions submitted previously by the Jewish deputies. After indulging in cruel vivisectionist experiments on human beings, the government finally realized that mere paper orders were powerless to remodel an economic order which centuries of development had created and that violent expulsions and restrictions might result in ruining people but not in effecting their amelioration. The committee was at work for three years. The results of its labors were embodied in a remarkable report submitted in March 1812 to Alexander I. Since Speransky's declaration of 1803, reproduced above, this official document was the first to utter a word of truth on the Jewish problem. It is proposed, the report declares, to remove the Jews from the rural liquor traffic because the latter is considered harmful to the population. But it is obvious that the root of the drinking evil is not to be found with the saloon keepers, but in the right of distilling or propination, which constitutes the prerogatives of the squires and their main source of income. Let us suppose the 60,000 Jewish saloon keepers to be turned out from the villages. The result will be that 60,000 Russian peasants will take their places, tens of thousands of efficient farmhands will be lost to the soil, while the Jews cannot be expected to be transformed into capable agriculturalists at a moment's notice, the less so as the government has no resources to effect this sudden transformation of saloon keepers into corn growers. It is not true that the village Jews enriches himself at the expense of the peasant. On the contrary, he is generally poor and ekes out a scant existence from the sale of liquor and by supplying the peasants with the goods they need. Moreover, by buying the corn on the spot, the Jew saves the peasants from wasting his time in traveling to the city. Altogether, in rural economic life, the Jew places the role of a go-between, who can be spared neither by the squire nor by the peasant. To transfer all village Jews 
to the cities and convert them into manufacturers, merchants, and artisans is a matter of impossibility, for even the Jewish population already settled in the cities is scarcely able to make a living, and to create factories and mills artificially would be throwing money into the water, especially as the exchequer has no free millions at its disposal to enable it to grant subsidies to manufacturers. The recent experiments of the government have had no effect. On the contrary, the Jewish people has not only remained in the same state of poverty, but has even been reduced to great destitution as a result of having been forced out of a pursuit which had provided it with a livelihood for several centuries. Hence, the committee, realizing this situation of a whole people and being afraid that the continuation of compulsory measures in the present political circumstances may only exasperate these people, already restricted to the utmost, deems it necessary to put a resolute stop to the now prevailing method of interference by allowing the Jews to remain in their former abodes and by setting free the pursuits suspended by Clause 34. The government submitted. In yielding, it was moved not so much by the clear and incontrovertible arguments of the committee, which amounted to a deadly criticism of the current system of state patronage, as by the political circumstances alluded to in the concluding sentences of the report. Napoleon's army was marching towards the Russian frontier. The war which was to embroil the whole of Russia and subsequently the whole of Europe had broken out. At such a moment, when the French army was flooding the whole of Western Russia, it seemed far more dangerous to create groups of persecuted and embittered outcasts than it had been in 1807, when the French invasion was merely a matter of apprehension. In these circumstances, the question whether the Jews should be left in the villages and hamlets found a favorable solution of itself without any special new case. Stirred to the core, Russia, in the moment of national danger, had to rely for her salvation upon the strenuous exertions of all her inhabitants, Jews included. End of section 22section twenty three of history of the jews in russia and poland volume one from the beginning until the death of alexander the first eighteen twenty five by shimon dubnov translated by israel friedlander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by s s kim seoul south korea chapter ten the enlightened absolutism of alexander the first part three 4. The Patriotic Attitude of Russian Jewry During the War of 1812 The part played by the Jews in the War of 1812 was not so insignificant as historians are generally disposed to assume, being misled by the fact that the Jews of Russia were not yet drafted into the army. It must be borne in mind that the Great War was enacted in Western Russia more particularly in northwestern Russia, on territory inhabited by a compact Jewish population scattered all over the cities, townlets, and villages. The sympathy of this population with one or the other of the belligerents frequently decided the success or failure of the detachment situated in that locality. It is a well-known fact that the Poles of the Western region were mostly on the side of Napoleon, from whom they expected the restoration of the Polish kingdom. As for the Russian Jews, their attitude towards the belligerent parties was of a more complicated character. 
The recent persecutions of the rural Jews were apt, on the one hand, to set their hearts against the Russian government, and had these persecutions continued, the French would have been hailed by the oppressed Jews as their saviors. But the expulsions from the village had been stopped three years before the war, and the Jews anticipated the complete repeal of the cruel law which had been so severely condemned in the official report of the committee laid before the Tsar in the beginning of 1812. Moreover, the deputies of the Kahals, who had been summoned twice to share in the works of the government in 1803 and 1807, had an opportunity to convince themselves that Alexander I's government was on the whole favorably disposed towards the Jews, and its mistakes were merely the outcome of the wrong system of state patronage, of the desire of the government to make the Jews happy according to its own rights by employing compulsory and correctional measures. On the other hand, Napoleon's halo had been considerably dimmed even in the eyes of the Jews of Western Europe now that the results of his Jewish parliaments had come to light. The Jews of Russia, who were all orthodox, regarded Napoleon's reform schemes as fraught with danger and looked upon the substitution of Kahal autonomy by a consistorial organization as subversive of Judaism. The Hasidic party, again, which was the most conservative, felt indebted to Alexander I, who, in a clause of the Statute of 1804, bearing on Jewish sects, had bestowed upon the Hasidim the right of segregating themselves in separate synagogues within the communities. The leader of the White Russian Hasidim, Rabbi Shneur Zalman, who at first had suffered from the suspiciousness of the Russian government, but was afterwards declared to be politically dependable, voiced the sentiments of the influential Jewish circles towards the two belligerent sovereigns in the following prediction. Should Bonaparte win, the wealth of the Jews will be increased and their civic position will be raised. At the same time, their hearts will be estranged from our Heavenly Father. Should, however, our Tsar Alexander win, the Jewish hearts will draw nearer to our Heavenly Father, though the poverty of Israel may become greater and his position lower. This was tantamount to saying that civic rightlessness was preferable to civic equality, inasmuch as the former bade fair to guarantee the inviolability of the religious life, while the latter threatened to bring about its disintegration. All these circumstances, coupled with the unconscious resentment of the masses against the invading enemy, brought about the result that the Jews of the Northwest everywhere gave tokens of their devotion to the interests of Russia, and frequently rendered substantial services to the Russian army in its commissary and reconnoitering branches. The well-known Russian partisan Davidov relates that the frame of mind of the Polish inhabitants of Grodno was very unfavorable to us. The Jews living in Poland were, on the other hand, also devoted to us that they refused to serve the enemy as scouts and often gave us most valuable information concerning him. As Polish officials could not be relied upon, it became necessary to entrust the whole police department of Grodno to the Jewish Kahal. The governor of Vilna testified that the Jewish people had shown particular devotion to the Russian government during the presence of the enemy. The Poles were irritated by this pro-Russian attitude of the Jews. There were rumors afloat that the Poles had made ready to massacre all Jews and Russians in the government of Vilna and Minsk and in the province of Bialystok. There were numerous instances of self-sacrifice. It happened more than once that Jews who had sheltered Russian couriers 
with dispatches in their houses or had escorted them to the Russian headquarters or who had furnished information to the Russian commanders as to the position of the enemy's army were caught by the French and shot or hanged. Alexander I was aware of these deeds while on the visit to Kalish he granted an audience to the members of the Kahal and engaged in a lengthy conversation with them. Among the Jews of the district, appeals written in the Jewish vernacular were circulated, in which the Jews were called upon to offer up prayers for the success of Alexander I, who would release the Jewish people from bondage. Altogether, the wave of patriotism which swept over Russia engulfed Jewish masses to a considerable extent. The headquarters of the Russian army, which was now marching toward the west, harbored during the years 1812 to 1813 two Jewish deputies, Sundel Sonnenberg of Grodno and Lyser Eliza Dillon of Nezwitz. On the one hand, they maintained connections with the leading government officials and conveyed to them the wishes of the Jewish communities. On the other hand, they kept up relations with the Kahals, which they informed regularly of the intentions of the government. Presumably, these two public-spirited men played a twofold role at headquarters, that of large purveyors who received orders directly from the Russian commissariat and forwarded them to their local agents, and that of representatives of the Kahals, whose needs they communicated to the Tsar and the highest dignitaries of the crown. In those uneasy times, the government found it to its advantage to keep at its headquarters representatives of the Jewish population who might sway the minds of the co-religionists in accordance with the character of the political instructions issued by it. In June 1814, during his stay abroad in Bruxelles, Germany, Alexander requested these deputies to assure the Jewish cards of his most gracious favor and promised to issue shortly an ordinance concerning their wishes and requests for the immediate amelioration of their present condition. It seems that Alexander I, who was still under the spell of the accounts of Jewish patriotism, was inclined at that moment to improve their lot. But the general reaction which, after the Vienna Congress of 1815, fell like a blight upon Europe and Russia, proved fatal also to the Russian Jews. 5. Economic and Agricultural Experiments the political upheavals of the transition period, 1789 to 1815, were bound to react violently on the economic status of Russo-Polish Jewry. The vast Jewish population of Western Russia was at that time divided into two parts. The larger part resided in the towns and townlets, the smaller lived in the villages. The efforts made by the Russian government during that period to squeeze the whole Jewish population into the urban estates and to single out from its midst a new class of agriculturists failed to produce the desired effect. Instead, it succeeded in disturbing the former equilibrium between the urban and the rural occupations of the Jews. The urban Jews was either a businessman or artisan or a saloon keeper. In many cities, the Jewish mercantile element was numerically superior to the Christian. The increased Jewish activity in the export trade is particularly noticeable. Jewish merchants traveled annually in large numbers to the fairs abroad, particularly to that of Leipzig, to buy merchandise, principally dry goods, at the same time exporting the products of Poland and Russia, such as furs, skins, etc. The gradual absorption of Polish territory by Russia opened up a new immense market, that of the central Russian provinces, for the goods imported from abroad. 
it was natural that the Jews began to flock to those provinces. But their way was at once blocked by the local Russian merchant, who began to clamor against Jewish competition and forced the government to recognize the monopoly of native interest to the detriment of the consumer. True, the monopolist did not succeed altogether in shutting the Russian interior to foreign cheap goods and finery, which the Jewish merchants still continued to import under the clause in the Statute of 1804, which granted Jews the right of visiting the interior governments on special gubernatorial passports. Yet, an untrammeled development of Jewish commerce was rendered impossible by this artificial barrier between Western and Eastern Russia. The second urban profession, handicrafts, was considered of lower rank than commerce. It was pursued by the poorest class of the population. Artisan labor commanded very low prices. Purely Jewish trade unions were rare, and when a Jewish artisan summoned enough courage to leave his native townlet and seek employment in a large city, he was sure to encounter the animosity of the organized Christian guilds. We have seen that before the second partition of Poland, such an encounter assumed the shape of a pogrom in the Polish capital. By the side of the store and the workshop stood the public house or saloon, which was generally connected with an inn or hostelry. The sale of liquor in the cities depended primarily on the peasants arriving from the villages on festival and market days. On the whole, the liquor traffic occupied a subordinate place in the cities. Its mainstay was in the villages. All serious observers of the economic status of the Jews at that time bear witness to the fact that in the majority of the cities, Jewish labor formed the cornerstone of a civilized economic life that without the Jews, it was impossible to buy or to sell or to have any kind of article made. The Jew, who was satisfied with small wages and profits, was thereby able to lower both the cost of production and the price of merchandise. He was content with the pittance, his physical needs being extraordinarily limited. Thanks to the mediation of the ubiquitous Jewish businessman, the peasant was able to dispose of his products on the spot, even those which, because of their small value, would not be worth carrying to the city. In spite of all his indefatigable, feverish labors, the Jew was, on the average, as poor as the peasant, except that he was free from the vice of drunkenness, one of the sources of the peasant's economic misery. The poverty of the Jews was the artificial result of the fact that the cities and townlets were overcrowded with petty tradesmen and artisans, and this congestion was further aggravated by the systematic removal of the Jews from their age-long rural occupations and the consequent influx of village Jews into the towns. It is necessary to point out that when the official records half on the liquor traffic in the villages as the sole occupation of the Jews, they fail to appreciate the many-sidedness of the rural pursuit of the Jews, which were connected with the liquor traffic, to be sure, but were by no means identical with it. While leasing from the squire or the crown the right of distilling, the Jew farmed at the same time other items of rural economy, such as the dairies, the mills, and the fishing ponds. He was furthermore engaged in buying grain from the peasants and selling them at the same time, such indispensable articles as salt, utensils, agricultural tools, etc., imported by him from the town. He often combined in his person the occupations of liquor dealer, shopkeeper, and produce merchant. The road leading from the village to the city was dotted with Jewish inns or public houses, which, before the age of railroads, served as halting places for travelers. This whole economic structure, 
which had been built up gradually in the course of centuries, the Russian government made its business to demolish. As early as the reign of Catherine II, the governors frequently drove the Jewish villages into the cities, acting under the organic law, which makes it incumbent upon Jews to register among the merchants or burghers. The ambiguous U.K. of 1795 to the effect that endeavors be made to transplant the Jews into the district towns so that these people may not wander about to the detriment of society, gave the zealous bureaucrats a free hand. When the law of 1804 ordered the expulsion of all Jews from the villages at the end of three years, many squires, without waiting for the time limits to expire, refused their Jewish tenants the right of residence and trade in their villages. The Jews began to rush into the cities, where even the long-settled residents could not manage to make a living. True, the government was luring the persecuted Jews into two new vocations, the establishment of factories and of agricultural colonies. But the impernicious village Jew had neither the capital nor the capacity for opening factories. Moreover, it was of no conceivable use to call industries artificially into being without having first secured the market for the manufactured products. Several woolen mills had been founded by Jews in Lithuania and Volhynia, but all they could do was to provide work for a few thousand people. It was thus natural that all eyes turned towards agricultural colonization. The Statute of 1804 promised to provide impernicious Jews desirous of engaging in agriculture with free land in several governments to grant them loans for their equipment and exempt them from taxation for a number of years. The exiled village Jews clutched at this promise as an anchor of salvation. In 1806, several Jewish groups in the government of Mogilev appealed to the governor to transfer them to New Russia, there to engage in corn growing. The delegates of one of these groups, Nahum Finkelstein, even traveled to St. Petersburg to lay the matter before the minister Kotzbai and was dispatched by the latter to the government of Kherson for the purpose of inspecting and selecting the land. The minister, acting in agreement with the governor of Kherson, Duke Richelieu, decided to set aside separate parcels of land in the steppes of that region and to settle Jews on them under the auspice of the new Russian Immigration Bureau. Scarcely had the two Mogilev groups completed the arrangements for their emigration when scores of similar applications began to come in from Jewish groups in other governments of the pay. By the end of 1806, the number of applicants mounted up to 1,500 families, numbering some 7,000 souls. The Russian authorities found themselves in an awkward position. They were caught unprepared for the transfer of so many persons at the expense of the state. In 1807, four colonies of Jewish agriculturalists were established in the government of Kherson, the first among the Jewish colonies of South Russia. The number of settlers amounted to some 300 families, consisting of 2,000 souls. The number of applicants desirous of settling on the land continued to increase. In the course of 1808, when the expulsion from the villages was in full swing, the white Russian governor bombarded the Minister of the Interior with petitions to allow as many Jewish families as possible to proceed to New Russia. The governor of Vitebsk reported that the rural Jews have been unseasonably expelled, ruined, and reduced to beggary. A large part of them is without daily bread and without shelter, and they emigrate in considerable numbers to New Russia. Many Jews, in the expectation of being transplanted to New Russia, have sold all their belongings and beg leave persistently to go there, though it be only for a domicile. 
At the same time, reports from the new Russian Immigration Bureau and from Duke Richelieu were constantly reaching St. Petersburg. They emphasized the necessity of stemming the tide of the immigrants in view of the fact that even the first parties of colonists had found it difficult to establish themselves, while the new ones could not expect to find either huts or any other accommodations. By the beginning of 1808, the Immigration Bureau was in charge of about 1,000 colonist families, and in addition, several thousand immigrants who had arrived voluntarily were waiting for their turn to be settled. As a result of the unaccustomed climatic conditions and the lack of housing accommodations and provisions, disease began to spread among the newcomers. All these circumstances decided the government to put a temporary stop to the settling of the Jews in the new Russian colonies. New case of April 6, 1810. The attempt to convert a part of Jewish population into agriculturalists would undoubtedly have met with huge success had the government been sufficiently prepared for such a momentous economic transformation. 10,000 emigrants had already gone to new Russia, and the compact starving masses were rushing after them. But the government was overwhelmed by the difficulties of the task and brought the whole movement to a standstill. Simultaneously, a stop was put to the expulsion from the villages in the western governments, which threatened to lead to an unparalleled economic catastrophe. Thus, after many vacillations and upheavals, the economic structure of Jewish life was re-established on its old foundations, commerce, handicrafts, and rural occupations. End of section 23section 24 of history of the jews in russia and poland volume 1 from the beginning until the death of alexander the 1st 1825 by shimon dubunov translated by israel friedlander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by ss kim seoul south korea chapter 11 the inner life of russian jewry during the period of enlightened absolutism. Part 1. 1. Kahal Autonomy and City Government The system of state patronage spread its wings also over the self-government of the Jewish communities. Towards the end of Catherine II's reign, the government clearly betrayed its tendency to curtail the extensive communal autonomy which the Jews had been guaranteed earlier in 1776, when the promise of the emperors to allow the Jews of annexed White Russia to retain their former liberties was still fresh in the official mind. But the Russian government, not in the habit of tolerating such licentiousness among its subjects, looked askance at the large economic, spiritual, and judicial functions granted to the Kahals in addition to their fiscal duties as the collecting agencies of the state taxes. As a result of this attitude, the UK's of 1786 and 1795 had limited the range of activity of the cars to spiritual and fiscal affairs. The Jewish constitution of 1804 went one step further by dividing these two functions between the rabbinates and the kahals, which had previously formed one whole. The rabbis were given permission to look after all the ceremonies of the Jewish faith and decide all disputes bearing on religion, while the kahals were ordered to see to the regular payments of the state taxes. This was all that was left of the ancient autonomy of the Jewish communities in Poland, with its vast network of institutions and central assemblies or wards. It is apparent that in real life the power of the communities was larger than on paper. 
The Jews went on submitting most of the cases, even those involving monetary disputes, to their own rabbinical tribunals. The prohibition of imposing the harem, excommunication upon obstreperous members of the community, was occasionally disregarded since the spiritual tribunals had no other means of coercion at their disposal. On the other hand, the government itself, being in need not only of the fiscal services of the cars, but also of a responsible organization to be consulted upon Jewish matters, could not help tolerating the extension of car activities far beyond the range of fiscal interest. When the government was desirous of ascertaining the views of the Jewish communities on some of the measures planned by it, it addressed itself, as was the case in 1802, 1803, and 1807, to the Kahals and authorized them to send delegates to St. Petersburg or the provincial capitals. This extension of Jewish autonomy was a concession wrested from the government by the force of circumstances, by the power of a compact population, living a life of its own and refusing to efface itself to the point of merging with the surrounding population and fusing all its public interest with the affairs of the general city administration. Yet it was just this municipalization of the Jewish communities that the Russian government had been aiming at for a long time. From the time of Catherine II, it cherished the thought of destroying Jewish separateness by forcing the Jews into the framework of the Russian class organization, particularly into the estates of the merchants and burghers. When, shortly after 1780, the Jews were accorded the hitherto unheard of privilege of participating in the city government with the right of active and passive suffrage for the magistracies and municipal courts, the lawgivers of St. Petersburg were confident that Russian Jewry, in a transport of delight, would throw overboard its old Karl autonomy and eagerly coalesce with the Christian urban estate to form a common municipal organization. But neither the Jews nor the Christian justified these confident expectations. The former, while clinging as heretofore to their time-honored communal organization, were glad to participate in the elections to the magistracies in which up till then their traditional enemies, the Christian merchants and burghers, had been the masters and in which they frankly proposed to protect their interest representing, as they did, a considerable portion of the urban population. But here they encountered furious opposition on the part of their Christian fellow residents. In the two white Russian governments of Vitebsk and Mogilev, several Jews had been elected to the magistracies as aldermen and members of the law courts. But in the majority of cases, the Christian managed to obtain an artificial majority and keep the Jews out of the municipal administration. Complaints lodged with the central authorities in St. Petersburg were of no avail for the Russian, and even more so, the Polish burghers regarded the bestowal of municipal rights upon the Jews as a violation of their own chartered privileges. Yielding to this mood of the Christian population, the administrator of the southwestern government established on their own responsibility a restrictive percentage for the participation of the Jews in the magistracies by limiting, even in places with a predominantly Jewish population, the number of Jewish members to be elected to the magistracies to one-third. The representatives of the Jewish majority of the population in the city administration were thus invariably reduced to a minority and were not in a position to protect the interests of their co-religionists, either in the assessment of the municipal taxes or in the cases brought before the municipal law courts.
Here, too, the protest addressed to St. Petersburg by a delegate acting on behalf of the Bodleian Jews did not remedy the situation. In the two Lithuanian governments, which had fallen into the hands of Russia after the third partition of Poland in 1795, the Christian opposition scored even a greater success. For here, it became necessary to suspend altogether the operation of the law granting the Jews representation in the magistracies. When the senatorial U case of 1802, making the Jews eligible for public office, became known in Vilna, the local Christian population raised the cries of indignation. The Philistine arrogance of the old city fathers combined with the low motives of religious and class hatred manifested itself in a petition addressed in February 1803 by the Christian burghers of Vilna to Alexander I. In this petition, the residents of Vilna protest against the violation of their ancient privilege in pursuance of which Jews and members of other faiths are forbidden to hold office in Lithuania. The admission of Jews to the magistracies is a misfortune and a disgrace for the capital of Lithuania, for they, the Jews, have not the slightest conception of morality, while their form of education does not fit them for the calling of a judge, and altogether this people can only maintain itself by all kinds of trickery. The Christians will lose all interest in accepting public office once the Jews are given the right to dominate them. The petitioners point out threateningly that the domination of the Jews, i.e. their participation in the magistracies, though it be limited to one-third of the number of the aldermen, will undermine the people's confidence in the municipal administration and judiciary. For the obedience of the mob will be turned into defamation when the Christian who enters the sacred place of justice beholds the Jew as his superior and judge, submission to whom is unnatural by reason of class and religion. The Christian population of Kovno resulted in presenting a similar petition to another incontrovertible argument against the admission of Jews to municipal offices. Referring to the cross with the sacred figure of the crucifixion, which is placed on the court table for the administration of the oath, the petitioners assert that Jewish members of the courts will refuse to look upon it, but by reason of their faith will think disrespectfully of it, so that instead of judicial impartiality, there will be mockery of the Christian law. The government found these arguments convincing and, in 1805, repealed the UKs of the Senate concerning the election of Jews to the magistracies of Lithuania. In this way, the stolid rancor of the privileged burghers in some places handicapped the activity of the Jews in the city administration and in others entirely suppressed it. The Jewish communities, backwards though they were, displayed sufficient civic courage to send their representatives to the camp of the enemy to work in common with him for the benefit of the whole urban population. But the narrow-minded burghers, who were thoroughly saturated with medieval prejudices, would not recognize the Jews as their fellow townsmen. The Jews had to reckon with this coarse conservatism of the surrounding population. They were still able to fall back upon their own communal self-government, and had their social energies been directed towards that end, the old Kahal autonomy, in spite of all government restrictions, might to a certain extent have come into its own again. But another factor thwarted this revival, the deep rift in the Russian Jewish community, which began with the rise of Hasidism in the second half of the 18th century 
and was an accomplished fact at the beginning of the 19th century. 2. The Hasidic Schism and the Intervention of the Government The period of Poland's partitions was also a period of divisions within Polish Jewry. The external division was accompanied by an internal split, the political partition by a spiritual schism. The body of Polish Jewry was divided among Russia, Austria and Prussia, and its soul between Rabbinism and Hasidism. There was even a significant coincidence in dates. The first declaration against Hasidism by the Rabbinates of Vilna, which started the religious schism, was issued in 1772, in the year of the first Polish partition, and the second emphatic declaration of the same rabbinate, which completed the schism, followed close upon the third partition of Poland in 1796. The interval between these two dates represents one continuous stretch of Hasidic triumphs. The Russian southwest, Volhynia, the province of Kiev, and Podolia had by the end of the period been almost completely conquered by the Hasidim. With the exception of a few cities, they now formed the predominating element in the communities, their ritual was adopted in synagogue worship, and their spiritual rulers, the Tzaddiks, exercised control over the official rabbinates. As far as the Northwest is concerned, Hasidism had managed during that interval to obtain a foothold in White Russia, the only Polish province which for over 20 years had been under Russian domination and thus politically severed from the rest of curtailed Poland. Under the leadership of the Tzadik Shneur Zalman of Lozno, a strong Hasidic center had been built up in that part of the northwest, but there were yet no compact Hasidic communities in that region. In the majority of towns, the communities were composed of both elements, Hasidim and their opponents, the rabbinists, who were nicknamed Mitnabdim, Protestants, the preponderance being now on this side, now on the other, a state of affairs which gave rise to endless dissensions in the kahals and synagogues. In Lithuania alone, the stronghold of Rabbinism, Hasidism failed to take root. Here, a small Hasidic groups were ensconced in a number of cities. They held their services in modest rooms in private residences, minyanim, which they were often forced to hide from the gaze of the hostile Kahal authorities. In Vilna, the residence of the great zealot of Rabbinism, Elijah Gaon, the Hasidim constituted an illegal secret organization. Only in the suburb of Pinsk, in Kalin, the Hasidim succeeded in establishing themselves firmly and could boast of having their own synagogues and tzaddiks. Kalin became the seat of Hasidic propaganda, extending all over Lithuania, where the Hasidim were accordingly nicknamed Kaliners. The second and third partition of Poland which united Lithuania and White Russia under the sovereignty of Russia, tended to buoy up the oppressed Lithuanian Hasidim, who could now join forces against the common enemy with their brethren all over the northwestern region. The Hasidic propaganda took on new courage. To enhance the success of their missionary activity, the Hasidim spread the rumor that the former anti-Hasidic thunderer, the veteran rabbi Elijah Gaon, was sorry for all the hostile acts he had committed against the sectarians, and that, in consequence, the excommunication formerly hurled by him against them was no longer valid. When this clever ruse became known in Vilna, the indignant champions of rabbinism prompted the aged Gaon to publish an epistle in which he reformed his former attitude towards the heretics and declared that all the harems previously issued against them remained in force. May 1796 The epistle was entrusted to two envoys who were dispatched from Vilna to a number of cities for the purpose of stirring up an anti-Hasidic agitation. When the envoys arrived in Minsk and set about executing their instructions, 
The Hasidim started a rumor to the effect that the Gaon's signature under the epistle was not genuine. The Kahal of Minsk sent an inquiry to Vilna, and in reply received in September 1796 a new energetic appeal of the Gaon addressed to all the gubernatorial Kahals of Lithuania, White Russia, Volhynia, and Podolia. Yea, mountains of Israel, cried the great zealot, Yea, spiritual shepherd, and yea, lay leaders of every government, also yea, the heads of the cars of Mogilev, Polotsk, Zitomir, Vinitsa, and Kamenets Podolsk, you hold in your hand a hammer where it you may shatter the plotters of evil, the enemies of light, the force of the Jewish people. Woe unto this generation! They, the Hasidim, violate the law, distort our teachings, and set up a new covenant. They lay snares in the house of the Lord, and give a perverted exposition of the tenets of our faith. It behooves us to avenge the law of the Lord. It behooves us to punish these madmen before the whole world for their own improvement. Let none have pity on them and grant them shelter. Guard yourself with zeal in the name of the Lord. In calling to arms against the Hasidim in these fulminant terms, the venerable knight of Rabbinism was moved by the profound conviction that the new sect, which by that time numbered its adherents by the hundreds of thousands, was leading the Jewish religion and nation to ruin, because it was rending asunder the Jewish camp internally, while the political upheavals were severing it externally. He was moreover alarmed by the luxuriant growth of the cult of the tzaddiks, or miracle workers, which constituted a menace to the purity of the Jewish doctrine. The Gaon's ayo was particularly aroused by a work published in the same year as his epistle, 1796, by Rabbi Shneur Zalman, the head of the white Russian Hasidim. The work was familiarly called Tanyo and contained the bold exposition of the pantheistic doctrine of Hasidism, which the champions of the established dogma were prone to regard as blasphemy and heresy. The Gaon's proclamation hinted at this work, and its author fell painfully hurt by the attack. Shinir Zalman responded in a counter-epistle, in which he tried to prove that the patriarch of rabbinism had been misinformed about the true essence of Hasidism, and he invited his opponent to a literary dispute for the purpose of elucidating the truth and restoring peace in Israel. But the Gaon refused to enter into polemics with the heretic. In the meantime, the Vilna epistle continued to circulate in many communities, and gave rise to severe conflicts between Mitnachtim and Hasidim, the former as a rule taking the offensive. Exasperated to the point of madness by these persecutions, the Hasidic Association of Vilna was stung into perpetrating an act of gross tactlessness. When, in the fall of 1797, about a year after the publication of his last circular, the aged Gaon closed his eyes, and the whole community of Vilna was plunged into mourning. The local Hasidic society met in a private house and indulged in a gay drinking bout to celebrate the deliverance of the sect from its principal enemy. This ugly demonstration arranged on the day of the funeral raised a storm of indignation throughout the community. Before leaving the cemetery, the leaders of the community standing at the Gaon's grave pledged themselves solemnly to wreak vengeance upon the Hasidim. On the following day, the Kahal elders were called to a special meeting at which a series of repressive measures against the Hasidim was adopted. Apart from the measures to be made public, such as new bull of excommunication against the sectarians, the meeting passed several resolutions which were to remain confidential. A special committee of five Kahal members were appointed and was vested with large powers for the purpose of grappling with the heresy. Subsequent events proved that among the contemplated means of warfare 
was included the plan of informing against the leaders of the sect to the Russian government. It did not take long for the disgraceful scheme to be put into action. Soon, the prosecutor general in St. Petersburg, Opukin, received a denunciation directing his attention to the political misdeeds perpetrated by the chief of the Kalino Hasidic sect, Zalman Borkovich, son of Boruk, and his fellow workers in Lithuania. Under the influence of this denunciation, Lopukin, acting in the name of the Tsar, ordered the local gubernatorial administration only in the fall of 1798 to arrest Zalman, the head of the sect, in the townlet of Lozno, together with 22 of his accomplices who were found in Lithuania. Zalman was apprehended and dispatched post-haste to St. Petersburg, accompanied by a strong convoy. His incriminated followers remained under arrest in Vilna. Zalman was arraigned before the so-called secret expedition, a department which dealt with crimes of a political nature. A long bill of indictment was read out to him. He was accused of being the founder of a harmful religious sect, which had changed the order of divine service among Jews, of spreading pernicious ideas and collecting funds for mysterious purposes in Palestine. The cross-examination clearly implied the charge of political disloyalty. To all questions laid before him, the accused gave an elaborate written reply in Hebrew. Zalman's defense, which was translated from the Hebrew into Russian, produced a favorable impression in government circles. Acting upon the report submitted to him by the prosecutor general, respecting all the circumstances revealed by the investigation, Tsar Paul I issued an order to liberate Zalman and the other sectarian chiefs who had been placed under arrest, but to keep a strict watch over them as to whether there exists or is liable to come into existence a secret relationship or correspondence between them and those who entertain perverted notions concerning the authorities and the form of government. Towards the end of 1798, Zalman was allowed to return home, and the other prisoners were likewise set at liberty. Now it was the turn of the Hasidim to retaliate on their persecutors. In view of the fact that the persecution against them had been instigated by the Kahal elders of Vilna, who had composed the Committee of Five, the Hasidim made up their mind to depose these elders and put their own partisans in their places. With the help of Bakshishi, the Vilna Hasidim managed to secure the good will of the gubernatorial administration. In the beginning of 1799, they lodged a complaint with the local authorities against the Kahal elders, charging them with having perpetrated all kinds of abuses, including the embezzlement of public funds. This action resulted in the removal and imprisonment of several elders. Under official pressure, their places were filled by new elders who either were themselves Hasidim or had been recommended by them. The community of Vilna was rent in twain. One section remained true to the dismissed elders, the other stood up for the newly elected. The warring factions were busy sending complaints and denunciations directed against each other to the government in St. Petersburg. The canker of informing, which, perhaps not accidentally, had developed in the first years of Russian rule in Lithuania, brought to the front one hideous personality, a rabbi informer by the name of Avigdor Haimovich, son of Haim of Pinsk. Avigdor, formerly rabbi of Pinsk and the surrounding district, had been dismissed from office owing to the intrigues of the Hasidic members of the community, who were his opponents. What Avigdor lamented most was the loss of revenue. For a long time, the dethroned shepherd had been dragging his flock through the magistracies and law courts. Having failed in his efforts, he decided to wreak vengeance upon the leaders of the sect responsible for his ruin. 
In the beginning of 1800, Avigdor addressed in an elaborate petition to Tsar Paul I, in which he described the Hasidic sect as a pernicious and dangerous organization which was continuing the work of the former Messianic Sebastians. By a vast array of distorted quotations from Hasidic literature, the informer endeavored to prove that the teachers of the sect enjoined upon their followers to fear only God, not men, in other words, to disregard the authorities, including the Tsar. The denunciation was allowed to take its course. Early in November of the same year, the Tsardic Zalman Borkovich was rearrested in Lozno and dispatched to St. Petersburg under the convoy of two senatorial couriers. On his arrival in the capital, the Tsardic was incarcerated in the fortress and, after a cross-examination, confronted with his accuser, Avigdor. Zalman again replied in writing to the indictments against him, which now mounted up to 19 counts. He repudiated emphatically the charge of not recognizing the authority of the government, of immorality, of collecting money, and arranging meetings for secret purposes. Towards the end of November, Zalman was set at liberty, but was ordered to remain in St. Petersburg, pending the examination of his case by the Senate, to which it had now been transferred from the secret expedition. While the Senate was preparing to take up the case, the palace revolution of March 1801 cut short Paul's reign and placed Alexander I upon the throne. The political wind veered round, and on March 29, 1801, the new Tsar gave Zalman permission to depart from St. Petersburg. Having satisfied itself that the religious schism in Judaism was perfectly harmless from the political point of view, the government was ready to give it its sanction. One of the clauses of the Statute of 1804 permits the sectarians to establish their own synagogues in every community and to elect their own rabbis with the sole stipulation that the Kahal administration in each city shall remain one and the same for all sections of the community. As a matter of fact, the law merely recognized what had already become the living practice. The religious split had long been an accomplished fact, and the internecine strife of 1796 to 1801 was merely its final act. As for the communal organization of the Jews, which had already been undermined by the political changes, the schism proved nothing short of disastrous. The Kahals, weakened by inner struggles and demoralized by denunciations and bureaucratic interference, failed to present a united front in the first years of Alexander the Reigns, when the government was carrying out its plan of reform and invited the Kahal leaders to share in its labors. The communities of the Southwest, which were completely under the ban of Hasidic mysticism, reacted feebly to the social and economic crisis facing them. The Jewish delegates, who presented their views in reply to the official inquiries of 1803 and 1807, were recruited principally from the white Russian and Lithuanian governments where the political sense of the Jews had not yet been completely dulled. End of section 24section 25 of history of the jews in russia and poland volume 1 from the beginning until the death of alexander the 1st 1825 by shimon dubnov translated by israel friedlander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by ss kim seoul south korea chapter 11 the inner life of russian jewry during the period of enlightened absolutism Part 2. 3. Rabbinism, Hasidism, and Enlightened Berlinerdom. While in Western Europe the old forms of Jewish life were breaking up, the cultural development of the Jewish masses of Eastern Europe remained stationary. The two dominating forces in their spiritual life, 
Rabbinism and Hasidism watched with equal zeal over the maintenance of the old order of things. The traditional form of education remained unchanged. The old school, the Heder and Yeshiva, with its exclusive Talmudic training, supplied its pupils with a vast amount of mental energy, but failed to prepare them for practical life, and the girls and women remained entirely outside the influence of the school. Just as firmly established was the old-fashioned scheme of family life, with its early marriages between the years of 13 and 16, with the prolonged maintenance of such married children in the paternal home, with its excessive fertility in the midst of habitual poverty, with its reduction of physical wants to the points of exhaustion and degeneration. This patriarchal mass of Jews fought shy of all cultural novelties and deprecated the slightest attempt to extend its mental and social horizon. Religious culture had not yet had a chance to cross sword with secular culture. The war between Hasidism and Rabbinism was fought on purely religious soil. Its sole issue was the type of the believer. The old discipline with its emphasis upon the scholastic and ceremonial aspect of Judaism was fighting against the onrush of ecstatic mysticism and the blind cult of saints. It cannot be said that benumbed rabbinism revived under the effect of this vehement contest. At the time we are speaking of, no distinct traces of such a revival are to be seen, and all one can discern are the signs of a purely scholastic renaissance. The method of textual analysis introduced by Elijah Gaon into Talmudic research, which took the place of the hair-splitting casuistry formerly in vogue, gained ever wider currency and an ever firmer foothold in the yeshivas of Lithuania. In the new center of Talmudic learning, the yeshiva of the Lithuanian townlet of Volozin, established in 1803, this novel method received particular attention at the hands of its founder, Rabbi Chaim Volozina, a pupil of the Gaon. The yeshiva of Volozin raised a whole generation of scholars and rabbis in the spirit of the Gaon. In these circles, one could even detect a certain amount of a toleration towards the anathematized secular sciences, though this toleration was limited to the realm of mathematics and partly that of natural history. The Gaon, who had himself engaged in mathematical exercises in his spare moments, permitted his pupil Boruch Shklover to publish a Hebrew translation of Euclid's Geometry, 1780. Yet the dread of philosophy was as great as theretofore, and the incompatibility of free research with Judaism was looked upon as an inviolable dogma. The Jewish mind continued to move within the narrow range of the four L's of Halakha, and was doomed to sterility. In the course of that whole stormy period, extending over a quarter of a century, Rabbinism, aside from the Gaon, had not put forward a single literary figure of any magnitude, not a single writer of large vision. It seemed as if the spirit of originality had fled from it. Greater productivity was to be found among the Hasidim of the period, although, in point of originality, it yielded considerably to the preceding era of the Peshit and his first apostles. Alongside of triumphant practical tzaddikism, trading in miracles and thriving on the credulity of the masses, we observe, to a certain degree, the continued development of the Hasidic doctrine on the lines laid down by Peshit. In the north, a new Hasidic theory was spreading, which strove to adapt the emotional pietism of Peshit to the intellectualism of the Lithuanian schoolmen. The originator of this doctrine, Rabbi Shneer Zalman, the hero of the religious struggle depicted in the foregoing chapters, endeavored to rationalize Hasidism 
which had manifested a decided leaning towards the principle credo quia absurdum sit. In the hands of the order of Tanya, the ecstasy of feeling is transformed into ecstasy of thinking. Occasionally, he speaks of the knowledge of God in terms of worthy of a Maimonides. Needless to say, Rabbi Zalman rejects the Tzadik cult in the vulgar form of miracle-mongering, which it had assumed in the South. In the South, to speak more exactly, in the Ukraine, Hasidism persisted in the beaten track. Its two pillars, Levi Itzok, Isaac of Berdichev, died 1809, and Nohum, Nahum of Chernobyl, died 1799, continued to uphold Beshit's tradition. The former, the order of Kedusat Levi, 1798, manifests in his work the genuine fervor of Hasidic faith without its morbid ecstasy. In his private life, this leader of Volinian Hasidism was the embodiment of loving-kindness, extending alike to Jew and non-Jew. Many popular legends tell of his surpassing affection for the humble and suffering. The Tzadik Nohum of Chernobyl, who was an itinerant preacher in the government of Kiev, laid in his sermons special emphasis on the elements of the Kabbalah. Towards the end of his life, he was primarily a Tzadik of the practitioner and miracle worker type, and founded the Chernobyl Tzadik dynasty, which is still widely ramified in the Ukraine. Quite apart from the rest stands the figure of the Podolian Tzadik and dreamer Naman of Bratslav, 1772-1810, a great-grandson of Beshit. Gifted with a profoundly poetical disposition, he spun the beaten tracks of the professional righteous and struck out into a path of his own. The goal he aimed at was the return to the childlike simplicity of Beshit's teachings. In 1798-1799, to Naaman made the pilgrimage to Palestine, just about the time when Bonaparte's army was marching through the Holy Land and the ghost from tempestuous Europe drifted through the slumbering east. But the Podolian youth had an ear only for the whisper from the tombs of the great Kabbalist teachers, Rabbi Shimeon ben Yohai and Ari, and for the discourses of the living Tzadiks who had settled in Tiberias. On his return to Europe, Naaman made his home in Bratislav and became the head of a group of Podolian Hasidim. In his intimate circle, he was wont to preach, or rather to muse aloud, on the reign of the Spirit, on the communion of the Tzaddik with his flock in religious ecstasy. He spoke in epigrams, sometimes clothing his thoughts in the form of folk tales. He wrote a number of books in which he constantly emphasized the needs of blind, unsophisticated faiths. Philosophy he regarded as destructive to the soul. Maimonides and the rationalists were hateful to him. The unfamiliar Berlin Enlightenment filled his heart with mysterious awe. Naaman's life was cut short prematurely. Surrounded by his admirers, he died of consumption in Uman at the age of 38. Down to this day, his grave serves as a place of pilgrimage for the Bratislav Hasidim. However, the average Tzadik of the type which had assumed definite shape in that period was equally removed from the complexity of Rabbi Zalman and the simplicity of Rabbi Naaman. On the whole, the Tzadiks drifted further and further away from the mission of religious teachers and became more and more practitioners. Surrounded by a host of enthusiastic worshippers, these middlemen between God and mankind understood the art of turning the blind faith of the masses to good account. They waxed rich on the gifts and offerings of their admirers, lived in palaces, much after the manner of the Polish magnates and church dignitaries. The court of Beshit's grandson in Medzibos, Boruch Turchinsky, 1780-1810, 
was marked by particular splendor. Baruch even had his court full, Hereshel Ostropolo, the well-known hero of popular anecdotes. In the original Polish provinces, afterwards incorporated into the Duchy of Warsaw, the commanders-in-chief of the Hasidic army were two tzaddiks, Rabbi Israel of Kozenitz and Rabbi Jacob Itzok, Isaac of Lublin. These two pupils of the apostle, Bear of Mezerich, became the pioneer of Hasidism on the banks of the Vistula towards the end of the 18th century. At the close of their careers, both died in 1815, the banner of Hasidism floated over the whole of Poland. The breezes of Western culture had hardly a chance to penetrate to this realm, protected as it was by the double wall of Rabbinism and Hasidism. And yet, here and there, one may discern on the surface of social life the form of the wave from the far off west. From Germany, the free-minded Berliner, the nickname applied to this new man, was moving towards the borders of Russia. He arrayed himself in a short German coat, cut off his earlocks, shaved his beard, neglected the religious observances, spoke German or the language of the land, and swore by the name of Moses Mendelssohn. The culture of which he was the banner bearer was rather shallow enlightenment, which affected exterior and form rather than mind and heart. It was Berlinerdom, the harbinger of more complicated Haskalah of the following period, which was imported into Warsaw during the decade of Persian domination, 1796 to 1806. The contact between the capitals of Poland and Prussia yielded its fruits. The Jewish dandy of Berlin appeared on the streets of Warsaw, and not infrequently the long robe of Polish Hasid made way timidly for German court, the symbol of enlightenment. Alongside of this external assimilation, attempts were also made to copy the literary models of Prussian Jewry. In 1796, a Jewish Mendelssohnian named Jacques Kalmanson published a French pamphlet in Warsaw under the title Essai sur l'état actuel de Juif de Pologne et leur perfectibilité, dedicating it to the Prussian minister Hoim, who had carried out Jewish reforms in the Polish provinces of Prussia. The pamphlet contains an account of the status of Polish Jewry of his time and the plan for its amelioration. The account is rather superficial, concocted after the approved Western recipe. In the judgment of the author, the misfortune of the Jews lies in their separation from the surrounding nations and their happiness in merging with them. The scheme of reform proposed by the Jew Kalmanson differs but slightly from the Polish project of Butrymovich and Chetsky. It advocates equally the weakening of rabbinical and kahal authority, the extermination of Hasidism and Tzadikism, the introduction of German dress, and the shaving of beards, the establishment of German schools, and in general, the cultivation of civism. The mold of Berlin fashion was overlaid with the Parisian veneer when soon afterwards, 1807 to 1812, at the bidding of Napoleon, the Dutch of Warsaw sprang into being. Now a new note was sounded. A group of Parisian dandies claim equal rights as a compensation for having changed their dress and their moral conduct. Even respectable representatives of the Warsaw Jewish community designate themselves in their petition to the Senate as members of the Polish nation of the Mosaic persuasion, copying the latest Parisian fashion in vogue at the time of the Napoleonic Sinédion. This was the first, though as yet naive and unsophisticated, attempt to secure the transfer from the Jewish nation to the Polish, the germ of the future poles of the Old Testament persuasion. The torchbearers of Berlin culture from among the followers of David Friedlander encouraged this frame of mind in every possible manner, and in their organ 
constantly appealed in this spirit to their Polish brethren. How long will you continue, one of these appeals read, to speak a corrupt German dialect, Yiddish, instead of the language of your country, the Polish? How many misfortunes might have been averted by your forefathers had they been able to express themselves adequately in the Polish tongue before the magnates and kings? Take a group of a hundred Jews in Germany, and you will find that either all or most of them can speak to the magnates and rulers, but in Poland, scarcely five or ten out of a hundred are capable of doing so. Some stray seeds of Western Enlightenment were carried as far as the distant Russian north. During Dirzavin's tour of inspection through the White Russia, there flitted across his vision the figure of the physician Frank in Kreslavka, an avowed follow of Mendelssohn, calling for religious and educational reforms. In St. Petersburg, in the house of the Mycenaeus Abraham Peretz, lived his teacher, Judah Leif Nevakovich, a native of Podolia. In 1803, the same year in which the Jewish deputies sojourned in St. Petersburg, Nevakovich published a pamphlet in Russian under the title The Wailing of the Daughter of Judah, with a dedication to Kotzbai, the Minister of the Interior and Chairman of the Jewish Committee. The dedication strikes the keynotes of the wailing, genuflection before the greatness of Russia, and mortification at the fate of his co-religionists, who are deprived of their share in the blessings of the country. How greatly, exclaims the author, doth my soul exult over these matters, the victories and might of the Russian Empire. How deeply doth it grieve over my co-religionists, who are removed from the hearts of their compatriots. And throughout the whole of pamphlet, the daughter of Judah bewails the fact that neither the 18th century, the age of humanity, toleration and meekness, nor the smiling spring of the present century, the beginning of which had been crowned by the accession of Alexander the Merciful, has removed the deep-seated Jewish hatred in Russia. Many minds doom the tribe of Judah to contempt. The name Judean has become an object of ridicule, contempt, and scorn for children and the feeble-minded. With particular reference to Mendelssohn and Lessing, the author exclaims, You search for the Jew in man. Search for man in the Jew, and you will no doubt find him. Dievakovich's pamphlet concludes with a grievous moan. While the hearts of all the European nations have drawn nearer to one another, the Jewish people still finds itself despised. I feel the full weight of this torment. I appeal to all who had sympathy and compassion. Why do you sentence my entire people to contempt? Thus wailed sadly the daughter of Judah, wiping her tears, sighing and yet uncomforted. The author himself, by the way, subsequently managed to obtain comfort. A few years after the publication of The Wailing, still finding himself removed from the hearts of his compatriots, he discovered the magic key to these obstreperous hearts. He embraced Christianity and, transformed into Lev Alexandrovich Nevakovich, began to write moralizing Russian plays which pleased the unsophisticated taste of the Russian public of the day. Nevakovich thus carried his Berlinerdom to that dramatic denouement, which was in fashion in Berlin itself, where an epidemic of baptism was raging. His example was followed by his patron, Abraham Peretz, who had been ruined in the War of 1812 by military contract. The descendants of both converts occupied important posts in the Russian civil service. One of the Peretz family was a member of the Council of State during the reign of Alexander II. A faint reflection of the Western literature of Enlightenment is visible during this period on the somber horizon of Russia. Mendel Lewin of Satanov, 1741 to 1819, who had been privileged to behold in the flesh 
the father of enlightenment in Berlin, scattered new seeds in his native country. He translated into Hebrew the popular manual of medicine by Tiso, the moral philosophy of Franklin, the books of travel by Kampf. He also made an attempt to render the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes into the vernacular Yiddish. The last undertaking drew upon ruin the rights of another enlightened writer, Tobias Feder of Piotrkov and Berdychev, died 1817, who attacked him savagely for profaning holy writ by turning it into the language of the street. Feder himself published studies in Hebrew grammar and biblical exegesis, moralizing treatises, harmless satires, and poetical odes. This publication cannot be said to mark an epoch in the realm of literature, but they undoubtedly symbolize a new departure in cultural life. The secular book, of which the mere appearance was apt to arouse a murmur of discontent among the alarmed orthodox, takes its place side by side with the religious literature of Rabbinism and Hasidism. These literary attempts were the harbingers of the subsequent secularization of Hebrew literature. End of section 25section 26 of history of the jews in russia and poland volume 1 from the beginning until the death of alexander the 1st 1825 by shimon dubnov translated by israel fidlander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by ss kim seoul south korea chapter 12 the last years of alexander the 1st part 1 1 the deputation of the Jewish people. The great reaction of 1815 to 1848, which kept the whole of Europe in its throes, assumed peculiar forms in Russia. Tsar Alexander I, one of the triumvirs of the Holy Alliance, which had given birth to its reaction, was eager to atone for the liberal sins of his youth and was cultivating in Russia the principles of paternal administration and Christian government. The last decade of his reign paved the way for the iron-handed absolutism of Nicholas I, which fettered the political and social life of Russia for 30 years and stood like an ominous specter of medievalism before the eyes of Western Europe. The destinies of the great monarch of the East determine those of the greatest Jewish center of the diaspora. The Vienna Congress of 1815 enlarged the borders of European Russia by including in it almost the entire territory of the former Duchy of Warsaw, which was renamed Kingdom of Poland. About two million Jews were huddled together on the western strip of the Russian monarchy during the period of 1815 to 1848, and this immense, sharply marked population served as the subject of all possible experiments which assume the coloring of the general Russian politics of the time. The last years of Alexander I inaugurate the period of patronage and oppression which reached its culmination in the following reign. The attitude of the Russian government towards the Jews during that period reflects three successive tendencies. First, in the last years of Alexander I's reign, 1815 to 1825, a mixed tendency of benevolent paternalism and severe restrictions. Second, during the first half of Nicholas I's reign, 1826 to 1840, a military tendency, that of correcting the Jews, by subjecting their youth from the age of childhood to the austere discipline of conscription and barrack training, accompanied by compulsory religious assimilation and by an unprecedented recruitance of idlessness and oppression. And third, during the latter part of Nicholas's reign, 1840 to 1855, the enlightened tendency of improving the Jews 
by establishing crown schools and demolishing the autonomous structure of Jewish life while keeping in force the former cruel disabilities, 1840 to 1855. This endless correctional and educational experimenting on a whole people, aggravated by the resuscitation of ritual murder trials and wholesale expulsions in approved medieval style, makes the history of Russian Jews during that period an uninterrupted tragedy. The beginning of the period did not seem to portend evil. Emperor Alexander returned from the Vienna Congress without harboring aggressive plans against the Jews. On the contrary, he remembered the patriotic services rendered by the Jews in 1812 and the promise given by him at Bruxelles to ameliorate their condition. As a matter of fact, several steps were taken which seemed to point in the direction of improvement. The first manifestations of this tendency were certain administrative changes in the management of Jewish affairs. The U case of January 18, 1817, ordered the Senate to submit all matters affecting the Jewish communes, with the exception of legal cases, to the general manager of the spiritual affairs of foreign denominations, a post occupied by Golitsyn, the Tsar's associate in Christian pietism and mystical infatuation. Later in the same year, the combined Ministry of Ecclesiastic Affairs and Public Instruction was organized under the guidance of Golitsyn, symbolizing, as it were, the establishment of public instruction upon the foundations of Christian piety. The charter of the new organization distinctly provides that all Jewish matters in charge of the Senate and the ministers are to be transmitted to the head of the new ministry. In this manner, the Jewish question was officially connected with the Department of Ecclesiastic Affairs, which at that time occupied a central place in the administration. The departmental change was followed by a more substantial reform. The government recognized the necessity of establishing at the Ministry of Ecclesiastic Affairs a permanent advisory council composed of elected Jewish representatives or deputies of Jewish communes. The project was suggested by the ephemeral and accidental endeavors in the way of popular Jewish representation on the part of the two purveyors, Sonnenberg and Dillon, who were attached to the headquarters of the Russian army during the campaign of 1812. At the audience at which Alexander I gave these deputies the assurance that the condition of their co-religionists would be improved, they were also told to appear in the capital after the conclusion of the war for the purpose of acquainting the Kahars with the plans of the government. The deputies accordingly appeared in St. Petersburg and entered upon their duties as Jewish spokesmen, which they exercised during 1816 and 1817. They realized, however, that they had no right to regard themselves as the accredited representatives of the Jewish communities of Russia, and therefore appealed to the government Sonnenberg was particularly active in this direction to instruct all the Kahars to elect a complete group of deputies in due form. The government having agreed to the proposal, a clause was included in the instructions to the newly established Ministry of Ecclesiastic Affairs to the effect that the names of the deputies of the Jewish communes shall after their election be submitted by the minister to his majesty for ratification. In the autumn of 1815, all the large cars received orders from the government to choose an electoral college, two electors for each government. In August 1818, the 22 electors chosen from 11 governments assembled in Vilna to elect from their own midst three deputies and an equal number of substitutes. 
The choice fell, apart from the former deputies Sonnenberg and Dillon, on Michael Eisenstadt, Benish Lavkovsky, and Marcus Weitelson, all from the government of Vitebsk, and Samuel Epstein from the government of Vilna. To provide for the expenses of the deputies who were to live in St. Petersburg, the Vilna Conference issued an appeal to all Jewish communities calling upon them to make an embroidery collection, i.e. to cut off and convert into cash the embroidered color which well-to-do Jews attached to their kittels, shroud one beneath the prayer shawls on the Day of Atonement, though the alternative of donating their value in money was allowed. The Jews, who had been ruined during the war, were evidently not in a position to tax themselves directly. Soon afterwards followed the establishment of a special department, which was placed at the service of the deputation of the Jewish people, the name by which this College of Deputies, presided over by the energetic Sonnenberg, was frequently designated. The College, either as a whole or through its individual members, labored for seven years, 1818 to 1825, but its activity was too limited to justify the expectations of Russian jury. The hope of the deputies that they would be consulted about the general problems bearing on the proposed amelioration of Jewish conditions failed to materialize. On the contrary, the government had in the meantime abandoned all thought of legislative reforms and a little later even began to contrive ways and means of carrying into effect the restrictive clauses of the Statute of 1804, which had been suspended in its operation by the War of 1812. The deputies who resided in St. Petersburg and did a great deal of lobbying frequently managed in their intercourse with the officials to ferret out these designs of the authorities and to communicate their finding secretly to the Kahal leaders in the provinces. At the same time, they endeavored of their own accord to avert the danger by personal negotiations with the leading officials. While reporting on the one hand to the Kahals, the deputies, on the other hand, transmitted to Golitsyn, the Minister of Ecclesiastic Affairs, the petitions of the Kahals and their complaints against the local administration. The deputies were thus reduced by the force of circumstance to mere go-betweens in Jewish matters. In exercising this function, some of them, Sonnenberg in particular, were indefatigable. They tried the patience of the high officials with their petitions and representations, and on one occasion, Sonnenberg was even deprived of his post of deputy for impertinent conduct towards the authorities. The bureaucracy of St. Petersburg began to resent these endless solicitations and this constant meddling with their plans. Gradually, the deputies themselves lost heart, having realized their importance in grappling with the rising wave of reaction. Some of them left St. Petersburg altogether. The downfall of Golitsyn's Ministry of Ecclesiastic Affairs, which had been undermined by the ultra-reactionary Arakchev party involved, as a natural consequence, the downfall of the curious Jewish representation affiliated with it. Golitsyn's successor as Minister of Public Instruction, the obscurantist Shishkov, made representations to the Tsar concerning the necessity of abolishing the institution of Jewish deputies, numerous instances having demonstrated that their stay here is not only unnecessary and useless, but even very harmful, inasmuch as, under the pretext of working for the public interest, they collect money from the Jews for no purpose and prematurely advertise the decisions and even the intentions of the government. In 1825, the deputation of the Jewish people was abolished. Thus ended an organization beautifully conceived, 
but mutilated in execution, one that might well have served as a substitute for Jewish communal representation and might have softened the regime of caprice and blighting patronage which ate deeper and deeper into the vitals of Russian politics. 2. Christianizing Endeavors It was quite in harmony with the spirit of the new era that the solicitude of the Russian government for the Jews should have manifested itself in an attempt at saving their souls. Christian pietism was the fashion of the day, and Alexander I and Golitsyn, the minister of ecclesiastic affairs, both of whom were mystically inclined, conceived the idea of becoming the instruments of divine providence in converting the Jews to Christianity. Golitsyn, who was the president of the Russian Bible Society and was anxious to make it a faithful copy of its English model, the Missionary Bible Society of London, approached the missionary's problem in his own way. On March 25, 1817, the Tsar published an ukase calling for the formation of a society of Israelitish Christians for the purpose of assisting Jews already converted or preparing for conversion. We have learned the UK's reads of the difficult situation of those Jews who, having by divine grace perceived the light of Christian truth, have embraced the same or are making ready to join the flock of the Good Shepherd and the Savior of souls. These Jews, whom the Christian religion has severed from their brethren in the flesh, lose every means of contact with them, and not only have forfeited every claim to their assistance, but are also exposed to all kinds of persecutions and oppressions on their part. Nor do they readily find shelter among Christians, their new brethren in the faith, to whom they are as yet unknown. For this reason, we, taking to heart the fate of the Jews converted to Christianity and prompted by reverent obedience to the voice of bliss which called unto the scattered sheep of Israel to join the faith of Christ, have deemed it right to adopt measures of their welfare. The welfare held out to the converts was of a rather substantial nature. Each of their groups was to be allotted free crown lands in the southern and northern provinces with the right of founding all kinds of settlements, townlets, and cities. They were to be granted full civil equality, extensive communal self-government, and special alleviations in the payment of taxes. These groups, or colonies of Jews, after being converted to the Greek Orthodox, Catholic, or Lutheran faith, were to form part of the Society of Israelitish Christians, which was to be managed by a special committee to be appointed in St. Petersburg under the patronage of the emperor. The solemn phraseology of the imperial UK shows unequivocally that the government was not satisfied with the modest task of rendering assistance to occasional neophytes. It was ready to embark upon a vast undertaking, that of encouraging baptism among the Jewish population and organizing the converted masses into separate privileged communes to serve as a bait for the Jews still languishing in their old beliefs. The imagination of the Russian legislators pictured to them the fascinating spectacle of huge masses of Jews marching to join the faith of Christ, drawn to it not only by heavenly, but also by earthly bliss. The missionary mood of the heads of the Russian government was speedily utilized by Louis Way, a representative of the London Bible Society. Way was thoroughly imbued with the apocalyptic belief in the approaching redemption of Israel under the aegis of Christianity. This, however, did not prevent him from looking upon present-day unconverted Israel with sentiments of profound respect 
as the banner bearer of a great divine mission in the history of mankind, and he was deeply aroused over the civil disabilities to which they were subjected in various countries of Europe. When the monarchs who had concluded the Holy Alliance assembled in the autumn of 1818 with their ministers and diplomats at the Congress in Aix-la-Chapelle, where he grasped the occasion to submit to Alexander I a memorandum concerning the condition of the Jews, in which he appealed to the Russian Tsar to emancipate the Jews of his dominions and persuade the Prussian and Austrian rulers to do likewise. In the course of my protracted travels through the lands of Poland for the purpose of gathering information about the Jews, I can say its way to the conclusion that Providence has not in vain placed so many thousands of Jews under the protection of three Christian sovereigns. Rather has this taken place in fulfillment of the promises given to the patriarchs. If the Jews are to join the flock of Christ, they ought to be treated like children and regarded as equal members of human society. Captive Israel must be set free materially before it can be liberated spiritually. Where therefore implores the Russian Tsar to set the example which will produce its effect upon the whole world. The Tsar received Wei's memorandum and turned it over to Nessel Roder, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, with instructions to submit it to the Congress for consideration. At a meeting of ministers plenipotentiary, representing Russia, Austria, Prussia, England, and France, held on November 21, 1818, Wei's memorandum, together with his elaborate printed project for a pan-European reform of civil and political legislation affecting the Jews, came up for discussion. The diplomats, who were least of all concerned about the Jewish question and had no desire to make this domestic affair of each government an object of international negotiations, agreed upon the following resolution. Without entering into the merits of this view entertained by the author of the project, the conference recognizes the justice of its general tendency and takes cognizance of the fact that the plenipotentiaries of Austria and Prussia, Metternich and Hardenburg, have declared themselves ready to furnish all possible information concerning the Jewish situation in those two monarchies in order to clarify a problem which must claim the attention equally of the statesman and the humanitarian. By means of this hollow, liberal-sounding phrase, which did not involve the slightest obligation, the diplomats managed to get rid themselves of this vexatious problem. Even the perfunctory attention given to it at the Congress having been prompted by no other motive than consideration for the Russian emperor. For the rest, every one of the three allied governments which had distributed Poland among themselves went on to handle its Jews according to the requirements of its domestic policy, which was frankly reactionary and was not even disguised by the fictitious label of humanitarianism. The same domestic policy continued in Russia. The Tsar, who abroad had listened benevolently to Wei's appeal for civil emancipation of the Jews, irrespective of the future salvation of their souls, decided, when at home again, to leave everything untouched, looking for a partial solution of the Jewish problem to the fantastic endeavors of the Society of Israeli Jewish Christian. Undeterred by the fact that the solemn appeal issued by the Tsar in 1817, had during the three years since its promulgation failed to attract a single group of converts for the simple reason that such groups were not in existence, there being only rare isolated instances of baptism, prompted in most cases by questionable motives, the government set aside in 1820 a large tract of land in the government of Yekaterinoslav 
for a future settlement of Israelitish Christians. It even appointed a special official with the title curator to take charge of it. But year after year passed by, and the empty land was waiting in vain for settlers, while the idle curator was just as vainly on the lookout for someone to take care of it. At last, in 1823, an obscure group of Israelitish Christians appeared on the scene. It consisted of 37 families from Odessa, who expressed their willingness to accept the free lands with all the manifold rights and privileges attached to them. Subsequent inquiries from the office of the Governor-General of New Russia revealed the fact, however, that the claimants to the public pie, though confessing the Greek Orthodox faith, did not possess certificates of baptism and could not even produce passports, with the result that the application of the adventurers was denied. At last, realizing the impracticability of the whole missionary scheme, Count Golitsyn advised Alexander I in 1824 to dissolve the mystical society of Israelitish Christians with its board of trustees, which by that time carried a whole step of government officials on its budget. The Tsar refused to liquidate by official action an undertaking which had been heralded so solemnly, and the society without a membership, administered by trustees without a trust, continued to figure on the lists of government institutions until 1833, when Nicholas I issued a curt ukase, putting a sudden end to this bureaucratic phantom. The new ruler had in the meantime discovered entirely different and by no means fantastic contrivances for driving the Jews into the fold of the Orthodox Church. These contrivances were the military barracks and the institution of Cantonists. End of section 26section twenty seven of history of the jews in russia and poland volume one from the beginning until the death of alexander the first eighteen twenty five by shimon dubnov translated by israel friedlander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by s s kim seoul south korea chapter twelve the last years of alexander the first Part 2. 3. Judaizing sects in Russia. While the Russian authorities were dreaming of a wholesale conversion of Jews to Christianity, their attention was diverted by the ominous spectacle of huge numbers of Christians embracing a doctrine closely akin to Judaism. The Russian officials disclosed the existence of a sect of Sabbatarians and Judaizers in the governments of Boronese, Saratov, and Tula, all of them without Jewish residents, who might otherwise have been suspected of a missionary propaganda among the Greek Orthodox. The new Judaizing heresy first engaged the attention of the central government in 1817, when a group of peasants in the region of Boronese addressed a petition to the Tsar in which they naively complained of the oppressions which they had had to undergo at the hands of the local authorities, both ecclesiastic and civil, on account of their confessing the law of Moses. Acting on the imperial instructions, Golitsyn gave orders to examine most rigorously the origin of the sect for the purpose of preventing its further spread and bringing back the renegades into the fold of orthodoxy. The Greek Orthodox Archbishop of Boronese reported in substance as follows. The sect came into existence about 1796 through natural Jews. It afterwards spread to several settlements in the districts of Bovrov and Pavlovsk. The essence of the sect, without being directly an Old Testament form of Jewish worship, 
consists of a few Jewish ceremonies such as Sabbath observance and circumcision, the arbitrary manner of contracting and dissolving marriages, the way of burying the dead, and prayer assemblies. The number of avowed sectarians amounts to 1,500 souls of both sexes, but the secret ones are in all likelihood more numerous. To exterminate the sect, the Archbishop of Bolognese proposes various measures to be carried out partly by the ecclesiastic authorities and partly by the police, among them the deportation of the soldier Anton Rovov, the propagandist of heresy. Similar reports from the ecclesiastic authorities of Tula, Olof, Saratov, and other great Russian church districts were soon received by the synod. The Judaizing heresy spread rapidly to the villages and cities, appealing alike to peasants and merchants. Whenever taken to task, the sectarians declared that they longed to return to the Old Testament and maintain the faith of their fathers, the Judeans. The central authorities were alarmed and resorted to extraordinary measures to check the spread of the schism. The Committee of Ministers approved the following draconian project submitted by Count Kotzbay in 1823. The chiefs and teachers of the Judaizing sects are to be impressed into military service, and those unfit to serve deported to Siberia. All Jews are to be expelled from the districts in which the sect of Sabbatarians or Judeans has made its appearance. Intercourse between the Orthodox inhabitants and the sectarians is to be thwarted in every possible manner. Every outward display of the sect, such as the holding of prayer meetings and the observance of ceremonies which bear no resemblance to those of Christians, is to be forbidden. Finally, to make the sectarians an object of contempt, instructions are to be given to designate the sabbatarians as a Jewish sect and to publish far and wide that they are in reality zid, in as much as their present designation as sabbatarians or adherents of the Mosaic law does not give the people a proper idea concerning this sect and does not excite in them that feeling of disgust which must be produced by the realization that what is actually aimed at is to turn them into zeeds. All these police regulations, in addition to a scheme of disciplinary ecclesiastic measures proposed by the Synod for the purpose of uprooting the Judean sect, were sanctioned by Alexander I, February and September 1825. The tragic consequences of these reprisals came to light only during the following reign. Entire settlements were laid waste. Thousands of sectarians were banished to Siberia and the Caucasus. Many of them, unable to endure the persecution, returned to the Orthodox faith, but in many cases they did so outwardly, continuing in secret to cling to their sectarian tenets. 4. Recrudescence of Anti-Jewish Legislation as far as the Jews are concerned, the immediate result of these measures were insignificant. The number of Jews involved in the decree of expulsion from the affected great Russian governments was infinitesimal, since, owing to the restriction of the Jewish rights of residence, the only Jews occasionally to be found there were a few traveling salesmen or distillers. Yet, indirectly, the Judaizing movement had a harmful effect upon the position of Russian Jewry. The government circles of St. Petersburg, which were religiously attuned, were irritated by the fact that so many from the Orthodox fold went over to the camp of the very people among whom the government had been hunting vainly for proselytes, and while the colonies so hospitably prepared for the Israelitish Christians were clamoring for inhabitants, many great Russian villages had to be stripped of their inhabitants who were deported to Siberia on account of their Jewish leanings. In the mind of Golitsyn, 
the minister of ecclesiastic affairs, the opinion gained ground that the Jews are enjoined by their tenets to convert everybody to their religion. These circumstances produced in Russian official circles a frame of mind conducive to repressive measures and helped to provide a moral justification for them. Accordingly, the last years of Alexander I's reign were marked by a recrudescence of religious oppression, which at times assumed the dimensions of wholesale persecutions. Sentiments of these kinds were responsible for the medieval prohibition against keeping Christian domestics. The prohibition was suggested by Golitsyn, a man otherwise far removed from anti-Semitic prejudices, and was officially justified in the senatorial UK case of April 22, 1820, by the alleged proselytism of the Jews. As instances of the latter, the Senate quotes the Judaizing movements in the government of Boronese, the communication of the governor of Kherson concerning certain Christian domestics in Jewish homes who had adopted Jewish customs and ceremonies and so forth. The same motives, strengthened by the tendency of removing the Jews from the villages, long since pursued by the government, suggested harsher restrictions in letting to Jews manorial estates with the peasants' souls attached to them. New cases issued in 1819 and in subsequent years enjoined the local administration to prosecute all so-called Crescentia contract transactions whereby the squire leased the harvest of a given year to a Jew, entitling him to employ the peasants for gathering the grain and hay and for other agricultural labors. Such transactions were looked upon as a criminal encroachment of the Jews upon the rights of owning slaves, which were the prerogative of the nobles. Orders were accordingly given that all such farm leases be taken away from the Jews, in spite of the complete ruin of Jewish lessees, who were left to settle their accounts with the squires. At the same time, the government set out again to realize its devout consummation, the expulsion of the Jews from the villages and hamlets already provided for by the Statute of 1804, though suspended for a time when the cruelty of the measure spelling ruin to tens of thousands of Jewish families had become apparent. The arguments by means of which the Jewish committee had endeavored in 1812 to convince and finally did convince the government of the impracticability of such a migration of nations were blotted out from the memory. The local and central authorities were again on the war path against the Jews. To renew the campaign against the rural Jews, the methods which had been tried with success in the time of Tirzabin were again resorted to. When in 1821, Hapless White Russia was again stricken by a famine which affected the Jews to a considerable extent. The local nobility was once more on the alert, placing the whole responsibility for the ruin of the peasantry on the Jewish tenants and salon keepers. The land laws proposed that the government expel all the Jews from the province or at least forbid them to sell spirits in the rural settlements since the Jews lead the peasants into ruin. The local authorities, in reply to an inquiry of Senator Baranov, who had been dispatched from St. Petersburg to White Russia, expressed a similar opinion. The question was first brought up before the committee, which was charged with the task of giving relief to the governments of White Russia, and included several ministers, among them the all-powerful Arakchev. The Relief Committee approved the restrictive project of the nobility, and so, a little later, did the Committee of Ministers. The result was a stern new case of the Tsar, addressed on April 11, 1823, to the governors of White Russia to the following effect. 1. 
to forbid the Jews in all the settlements of the governments of Mogilev and Vitebsk to hold land leases, to keep public houses, saloons, hostelries, posts, and even to live in them in the villages, whereby all farming contracts of this kind are to become null and void by January 1st, 1824. 2. To transplant all the Jews in these two governments from the settlements into the cities and towns by January 1st, 1825. In signing this U case, which spelled sorrow and misery for thousands of families, Alexander I gave verbal instructions to the Committee of Ministers to point out to the White Russian Governor General Kovansky ways and means of obtaining employment and designating sources of livelihood for the local Jews in their new place of abode. But no ways and means of any kind could mitigate the misery of people doomed to expulsion from their old nests and reduced to beggary and vagrancy. Immediately on the receipt of the U.K.'s, the local authorities embarked upon their task with relentless cruelty. By January 1824, over 20,000 Jews of both sexes had been driven from the villages of both governments. Holes of hapless refugees with their wives and children began to flock into the overcrowded towns and townlets. There they could be seen, stripped almost to their shirts, wandering aimlessly in the streets. They lived in frightful congestion, as many as ten of them being squeezed in a single room. They were huddled together in the synagogues, while many of them, unable to find shelter, remained on the street with their families facing the winter cold. Sickness and increased mortality began to spread among them, particularly in the city of Nebel. Even the anti-Jewish governor-general Kovansky, who was making a tour of inspection through the stricken district, was stirred by the spectacle and advised the committee of ministers to stop the disastrous expulsions. But the blow had been dealt. By the beginning of 1825, the majority of rural Jews had been expatriated and turned out into the wide world. The question naturally arises whether this human holocaust was required in the interest of the country. The government itself gave the answer 12 years later, when it was too late. As far as White Russia is concerned, quote the Council of State in 1835, Experience had not justified our anticipations of the usefulness of the indicated measure, the expulsion from the villages. Twelve years have passed since it was carried into effect, but from the data collected in the Department of Law, it is quite manifest that while it has ruined the Jews, it does not in the least seem to have improved the condition of the villages. The White Russian urge of destruction was merely the prelude to a new legislative campaign against the Jews. Almost simultaneously with the UK's ordering the expulsion of the Jews from the villages, another UK case was issued on May 1, 1823, calling for the establishment of a new committee for the amelioration of the Jews. The committee, which included among its members the ministers of interior, finance, justice, ecclesiastic affairs, and public instruction was entrusted with a very comprehensive piece of work to examine the enactments concerning the Jews past up to date and point out the way in which their presence in the country might be rendered more comfortable and useful, also what obligation they are to assume towards the government in a world to indicate all that may contribute towards the amelioration of the civil status of these people. In these soft-spoken terms was couched the public function of the committee, but its secret function, which later revealed itself in action, is correctly defined in the frank admission of the Committee of Ministers in its report of 1829. At the very establishment of the Jewish committee, one of the obligations imposed upon it 
was to devise ways and means looking generally towards the reduction of the number of Jews in the monarchy. This was evidently what the amelioration of the civil status of the Jews amounted to. The new committee was instructed to finish its work by the beginning of 1824, but its reactionary activity was not fully unfolded until the following reign. In the meantime, the legal machinery did not remain idle. The process of the territorial compression of Jews went on as before. To guard the western frontier of the monarchy against smuggling, it was decided, at the suggestion of the administrator of the Kingdom of Poland, Grand Duke Konstantin Pavlovich, to expel the Jews from the border zone. Two new cases were issued in 1825, ordering the removal of all the Jews residing outside the cities within 50 versts from the frontier, with the exception of those owning immovable property. Once again, human beings were hurled from their lifelong domiciles when a rational policy would have been content with instituting a closer watch. To prevent the undesirable multiplication of Jews in the border governments, Jewish emigrants from the neighboring countries, particularly from Austria, were forbidden to settle in Russia, 1824. Needless to say, the governments of the interior, where the Jews could sojourn only temporarily and where they had to produce gubernatorial passports, like foreigners, were carefully guarded against the invasion of the residents of the Pale. On his last trip from St. Petersburg to southern Russia in September 1825, Alexander I espied in a little village near Luga a Jewish family which was engaged in making tin plate, and he at once inquired on what ground it lived there. The governor of St. Petersburg was frightened and gave orders to have the family deported immediately from the district to censure the local Ispravnik and to warn the gubernatorial authorities that the rules concerning the Jews must be observed with all possible stringency. 5. The Russian Revolutionaries and the Jews Such was the attitude of the Russian government towards the Jews. But what was the attitude of the Russian people? Considering the character of the age in which public opinion was not able to express itself even in political literature, an answer to this question would be entirely impossible had not the revolutionary movement of the Decembrists disclosed the frame of mind of the most progressive section of Russian society in its relation to the Jewish question. Taken as a whole, it was an unfriendly attitude. It reflects the utter estrangement in language, in manners and in culture between Jews and Russians at that time, an estrangement which breeds suspicion and hostility. The Russian knew no more of the life of the secluded Jewish populace than he did of the life of the Chinese. The educated Russian looked with suspicion upon the exclusiveness of patriarchal Jewish life, the unintelligible religious ceremonies which surrounded it, the rigorism of the rabbis, the ecstasy of the tzaddiks, the strange emotionalism of the Hasidic masses. If he turned to books for an explanation of these strange phenomena, he would find it in the current pamphlet literature of Germany or Poland, with its hackneyed phrases about the fanaticism of the chosen people, a state in a state, etc. The attitude of the Decembrist towards the Jewish problem reflects the conventional ideas of an age of reaction. The Russian Truth by Pestel contains a chapter entitled On the Tribes Populating Russia, in which the Jewish problem is described as an almost indissoluble political tangle. Pastel enumerates the peculiar Jewish characteristics which, in his opinion, render the Jews entirely unfit for membership in a social order. The Jews foster among themselves incredibly close ties. They have a religion of their own, 
which instills into them the belief that they are predestined to conquer all nations and makes it impossible for them to mix with any other nation. The rabbis wielded unlimited sway over the masses. They keep the people in spiritual bondage, forbidding the reading of all books except the Talmud and other religious writings. The Jews are waiting for the coming of the Messiah, which is to establish them on their kingdom, and therefore look upon themselves as temporary residents of the land in which they live. Hence, their passion for commerce and their neglect of agriculture and handicrafts. Since commerce alone is unable to provide the huge masses of Jews with a livelihood, cheating and trickery are considered permissible to the injury of the Christians. Pestel had no eye for the heavy burden of Jewish disabilities and even considers the Jews a privileged class of the population since they do not furnish any recruits, have their own rabbinical tribunals, possess the right of educating their children in whatever principles they like, and moreover, enjoy all the rights of the Christian nations. Such was the vein in which a Russian revolutionary leader wrote, not knowing, or perhaps not caring to know, of the iron vice of the pale of settlement, of the pitiless expulsions which were taking place just at that time, ignorant altogether of the whole mesh of legal restrictions which placed the Jews on the lowest rung of Russian rightlessness. After presenting this picture of Jewish life, Pestel suggests to the future revolutionary government, the Supreme Provisional Administration, two ways of solving the Jewish problem. One consists in breaking up the influence of the close relationship among the Jews so injurious to the Christians, because it keeps them apart from the other citizens. For this purpose, he advises convoking the most learned rabbis and the most intelligent Jews. Pestel had evidently heard of Napoleon's Synhedrion, listening to their representations, and thereupon adopting measures for eradicating Jewish exclusiveness, for inasmuch as Russia does not expel the Jews, they ought to be the more careful not to adopt an unfriendly attitude toward the Christians. The second way consists in an honorable expulsion of the Jews, or to use his words, in assisting the Jews to form a separate commonwealth of their own in some portion of Asia Minor. To this end, Pestel makes the proposal to choose a rallying point for the Jewish people and to supply them with some troops so as to reinforce them. For, as Pestel continues, were all the Russian and Polish Jews to congregate in one place, they would number over two millions. Such a mass of people, being in search of a fatherland, would not find it difficult to overcome all obstacles which the Turks might place in their way and after traversing the whole of European Turkey, might pass over into Asiatic Turkey, and having occupied an adequate area, form a separate Jewish state. Pestel himself felt more attracted towards the latter alternative of solving the Jewish problem, but being fully aware that this gigantic undertaking depends on particular circumstances, he did not formulate it as a special obligation upon the Supreme Administration. Accordingly, if Pestel's first plan had materialized, the Jews of Russia would have received from the Supreme Provisional Administration not civil equality, but a stern regulament of the Austrian or old Prussian type, made up of a long string of correctional measures aiming at compulsory assimilation or russification, at the demolition of the whole cultural autonomy of Russian Jewry, not excluding the right of educating their children in whatever principles they like, and finally culminating in the economic curbing of Jewry, perhaps in the spirit of that very government against which the Decembrists were fighting. Pestel's view on Judaism was shared by many Decembrists, but not by all. 
The constitution drafted by the leader of Northern society, Nikita Muraviov, originally proposed to grant political rights to Jews only within their pale of settlement, but in the second draft, this limitation was replaced by the principle of perfect equality. End of section 27. End of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland. Volume 1 of 3. From the Beginning until the Death of Alexander I, 1825. By Shimon Dubunov. Translated by Israel Friedlander. 1876 to 1920.